merci d'être là ce matin. So, I'm going to switch to English. We have uh, people in London and people in uh, Hong Kong. So, uh, so it's my, my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Professor Joseph Teichmann. We we'll conduct this uh, seminar on uh, machine learning and its application to uh, deep uh, aging. Uh, just a few words of introduction. The world of finance is uh, evolving very fast and becoming more complex. And complexity generates risk and opportunities. So I think it is uh, critical for institutions like uh, Natixis to keep up with uh, financial innovation, uh, technological innovation, uh, like ma machine learning and its application is uh, one, uh, one of them. And machine learning is impacting uh, many aspects of, uh, of finance, among them uh, capital markets, with fast pricing, uh, optimal um, hedging, dynamic hedging, and, uh, and risk management. And um, it brings um, a change of paradigm. If you consider hedging, for, for example, uh, traditional hedging strategy using uh, theoretical uh, grids uh, don't uh, allow you to capture transaction cost, liquidity uh, impact, and um, machine learning will uh, allow you to now optimize your hedging strategies, taking into account uh, all kind of uh, frictions like transaction cost and um, uh, liquidity uh, impact. So this is the first seminar in a, in a series to, to come. And um, please let me know what are the topics you would like us to cover in, in the future that we um, with, uh, topics will be addressed by the best uh, experts in, uh, in the world, if, uh, if we can. So I don't want to take much time in my introduction. Let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Joseph uh, Teichmann. Pro uh, Joseph is a Professor of Mathematical Finance at the uh, ETH in, uh, in Zurich since 2009. Right. And uh, Professor Teichmann received his uh, PhD from, in mathematics from the University of Vienna in, uh, 2000, in 1999. Deep in the last century. Huh? Deep in the last century. Yeah. 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 And um, his uh, research interests uh, covers uh, stochastic finance, stochastic par partial differential equations, and obviously machine uh, machine learning. Uh, Professor Teichmann is a very talented um, researcher, and uh, we know well at Natixis. Uh, indeed, uh, Professor Teichmann uh, was the laureate in 2014 of the Louis Bachelier Prize of the Natixis uh, Foundation. Uh, which is sponsored and awarded by the uh, French was uh, by the French Academy of Science and uh, SMI, which is the Soci Société des Mathématiques Appliquées et uh, Industrielles. Um, picture in the photo. Well, just to remind you, that's you. Under la coupole of the uh, Institut de France. And the usual suspects you have uh, Madeleine, <laughs> Adil, and, uh, and, and uh, Professor uh, Olivier Pirono. Olivier Pirono is with us today. We're lucky to have him uh, here. And um, uh, Olivier is from the French Academy of Science. He was on the board of the Natixis uh, uh, Foundation. And on the picture, he didn't uh, wear the, uh, the suit, but uh, <laughs> now. <laughs> and so, don't be shy. I mean, uh, we expect this seminar to be interactive. Ask questions. People in London also, you're very welcome to interrupt and uh, ask questions. Same thing with uh, our friends in uh, Hong Kong. I guess they're going to spend the night with us. That's good. Um, so, we got a. No further ado, this floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks for coming. It's a big pleasure for me to, to do this uh, 
a lecture, a seminar uh, on machine learning methods which we use in finance since a couple of years uh, with you. Um, as uh, Michelle already said, uh, uh, I never heard the word professor so often, so Joseph is my name. Uh, uh, I am a mathematician. I am in working in uh, stochastic finance since uh, many years. And recently we have been um, exposed to several questions from the industry related to uh, machine learning methods in order to solve problems uh, from mathematical finance. Problems which we all know well, hedging problems, portfolio selection problems, uh, prediction problems, uh, problems of uh, stochastic control or stochastic games. And it was about three years ago that one of my friends, Hans Wieler, J.P. Morgan, approached me and asked uh, whether we can analyze how this machine learning technology works in, in, a, in a framework where one is interested to, to find hedging strategies, whether one can do it. And at this time, I, as usual, I have a, a working group, and my working group, a couple of PhD students, and one of my PhD students, Lucas Gorman, I could convince him to spend some time in London and to work together with Hans and then you, uh, uh, a co-worker of Hans in London to work out uh, machine learning yes, I implementation. Can say that, uh, machine learning, the application of machine learning uh, to finance is not, uh, uh, it's uh, you know, in operation now, that it's been, uh, it's not uh, the, um, it's been uh, in production at JP Morgan yeah. now for more than a year and a half. Right? Yeah. Um, it's not science fiction, by the way. No, it. this is uh, it's science. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, so we started to do that and uh, actually it turned to our greatest surprise, as to my greatest surprise, out to be very uh, surprisingly efficient to use this technology in order to solve uh, uh, a problem which uh, we uh, see in banking and financial industry every day all over the place. So this was about uh, um, three years ago, and also at the same time uh, we saw in, in newspapers uh, certain uh, uh, breakthroughs uh, coming with machine learning technology. I don't know if you remember for me one of the days which I remember is uh, December 5, I think it was December 5, uh, 2017. Let me show you. Well, it's not particularly quick, but it should work. Yeah. You see here, I think it was December 5. Yes, December 5. This Paper Mastering Chess and Shogi by Self Play with a General Reinforcement Learning Algorithm, December 5, Campus Square, London, Dubai. Uh, paper which is relatively short. Uh, explanations are also short, uh, not much detail. Fascinating result, namely that the uh, Go World Champion could be beaten by. Uh, tabula rasa machine learning implementation of uh, the game Go. So tabula rasa means you explain to the machine actually only the rules of the game and then you let by self-play the machine improve with a relatively generic algorithm, a surprisingly generic algorithm and uh, with uh, some computing power, so it's not nothing that we need here for computing power. I think we used uh, 5,000 tensor processing units, which uh, is actually a lot of computing power in order to achieve then this level. But finally, you could see the, the Go World Champion playing and saying, uh, as often people in Asia say, oh, when something really surprising and beautiful happens, so we saw moves which were Superhuman. 
and was finally uh, beaten a couple of times for this mission. So for me, this was another uh, aspect of uh, uh, another convincing argument uh, to uh, to uh, for, uh, to see that actually this technology produces efficient, surprising, and uh, uh, fascinating results which we have never seen before and uh, um, it is my pleasure today to speak about that to you uh, from several points of view before I start with the lecture before I go into the <coughs> applications to finance and to my view on it I want to get a little bit of feeling for you the audience so um, just I asked some questions, you answer, and uh, I would also like to stay in this mode that it is relatively interactive, so you interrupt me if something is uh, uh, questionable for you or if you see a critical point, and uh, um, I try to answer them uh, 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 live. So question, who had never so far um, anything to do with neural networks? Okay, so it will be new for you, and uh, I hope I can uh, give a good introduction to that. I start on the one hand at basics, on the other hand I try to reach relatively quickly uh, the frontiers of research. So I will uh, make it relatively heterogeneous the, uh, lecture. I hope uh, it works out, it's a little bit experimental. But uh, uh, this is also beautiful about that field that one can, can, uh, can do that. Who is not a mathematician in the audience? But you are quantitative in the sense that uh, you know how to calculate. You don't have a formal mathematical education, but you, are, uh, you, know, you understand finance. And you can't. Uh, who has never uh, worked with Python? Okay. I also tried to, to uh, say a couple of things there, but you will see the beauty of Python is that you can read it like an English novel. It is uh, written with this intention that it is very readable code. And uh, um, it's also one of the reasons why this technology advances so uh, in such a fascinating pace because the language which is usually used in very often in implementations is Python, which is open source, very accessible, very readable code, and also the packages which are used in order to do training of neural networks, in order to do learning tasks, are also open source. You can just uh, go home tonight in the metro you download uh, some of the files and you can run your first machine learning task this night, I guarantee you that this is also fascinating with this technology that it is so easily accessible. You can have the best training uh, packages technology on your laptop tonight and run your first machine learning task. Where do you get uh, code related to this uh, lecture? You find it on my webpage, uh, where you see different uh, versions of this lecture, which has been developed by my friend uh, Christoph Gutierrez, who is a professor in Vienna for uh, finance, and myself. In the last year, we developed this course, and Christa is giving this course in Vienna in one uh, version. I give the course in Zürich now already, uh, I think, the third time. And you see here uh, links to uh, <coughs> IPython notebooks. So these are implementations in Python, which you can view in a, in a, uh, in a code running viewer in, uh, in your browser. This is uh, uh, IPython notebooks. Just click on it. I think if the internet connection works well, you get that. Uh, go to the right corner, download, then you see actually how the code behind looks like and just download that in your, 
in your uh, folder and then you can run it with uh, iPad notebook viewer and you have precisely what I present here uh, on your uh, own computer. So as I said, there are seven lectures here uh, uh, on which I will rely uh, today. I will probably go through the first three or four uh, notebooks here and also there is a version with more exercises and a little bit more slides of uh, Christa's uh, lecture which she recently gave in uh, Vienna. Yeah. I have uh, via Michel also sent uh, to you a uh, short uh, mot emploi, how to uh, get a working uh, Python environment. What is one small complication with Python or with this technology is that you really have to pay attention to versions. It's not like LaTeX, which is downward compatible. You really have to pay attention which version of Python has been used in order to run this notebook. This notebook is running with Python 3.6, and the packages which are using are TensorFlow and Keras. Of course, uh, NumPy this is probably the most uh, downwards compatible package. But TensorFlow and Keras, there it really matters which version you use. And the version which I use here is uh, as we've written in the in the uh, on the web page. You have to use that. It can deviate a little bit from those numbers, but if you go further away. Uh, it's really, uh, it's not working, it's uh, not download compatible. So when you install your Python uh, environment, you have really as to look which version you install, and there is a, a version control uh, system, this is uh, called Anaconda, this allows you precisely to say, okay, I set up now an environment, and this environment is Python 3.6, and uses Keras, blah, blah, and so on. And I wrote in a motto how to get this uh, running. So I think everybody who wants to code has everything uh, now at, at hand. Okay. These were a little bit introductory words. Let me now go right away in media space and start with. Uh, very simple task which shows you aspects of machine learning which are right away uh, fascinating. Um, I do something which is very often done at the beginning, it's recognizing handwritten digits. There is a data set which is called the MIST data set, so these are handwritten digits digits from 0 to 9 and uh, what one would like to have is a machine, an algorithm, an implementation, a computer such that you give a picture of this handwritten digit to this machine and the machine tells you what is actually the meaning of this handwritten digit, so 0 up to 9, just classifying pictures. And uh, let me start right away. First we look whether the versions are correct. You see the versions here, Python 3.6, TensorFlow 1.8.0, Keras 2.08. Keras and TensorFlow is the training package which you have additionally to install in order to do the training task here. And then let me just uh, show you how this looks like. This is uh, a little bit uh, in a uh, uh, big picture, but it is actually one of those handwritten digits. This corresponds to the uh, ground truth 8. So this is the 8 handwritten. And we have actually 60,000 of those pictures available. And we would like to learn on those 60,000 pictures a map which has the property if I give a handwritten digit to it it gives me the correct uh, meaning, maybe the correct number. No? Mathematically speaking, this is a question of constructing a map. A map from pictures. What is a picture? A picture here is a matrix of, I think it is 
28 times 28, a picture of 28 times 28 numbers where the number so between 0 and 1, and they just correspond to the level of grayness you have in this picture. So here it will be 0, and you have like this here, and 1, and this is a black one, so this is 1, and so on. It's just a matrix. So we want to construct a map from such matrices. This is an almost 900 dimensional space, from, from a 900 dimensional space to a space of, uh, to a discrete space, a space of 10 points, namely the numbers from 0 to 9. I want to construct a map which has the property that on the training data it gives the correct uh, um, meaning. And if I give now a new picture to this, uh, to this uh, map, at least with a high probability it gives me the correct meaning too. Okay. Let me show you how that looks like and let me show you a couple of things which are fascinating in this area. So what I do here is just uh, take the picture, sorry, and uh, put them in the correct uh, order. So I have 60,000 pictures, 28 times 28 matrices of zeros and of numbers between uh, zero and uh, one. And now I. Uh, invite you to follow me first time setting up in this uh, neural network technology Keras a model. Model is a synonym for setting up a neural network. And what I do here is, in these couple of lines, I just make a composition, mathematically speaking, of an affine map and a nonlinearity. An affine map and a nonlinearity. An affine map and a nonlinearity. Uh, the affine maps have particular structures, these are convolutional layers, uh, and then there is a nonlinearity coming again, an affine map and the nonlinearity, and finally a 10 dimensional output is created. So, this is a 10 dimensional vector which is coming out. The vector is actually a vector of non negative numbers, and I say that the meaning of the output is a number between 0 and 9 if uh, when the maximum switch of this vector. So this is how you end up with the numbers from 0 to 9. So I do that. I build that model and I make a model summary for you. The model summary tells you uh, input, input is uh, 28 times 28, then we have this first uh, affine map, we have a nonlinearity, and actually the uh, matrix uh, is flattened out into a vector, another affine map, nonlinearity, and finally we have this 10 dimensional output. Yeah? So this is what is, uh, what is happening here. And now you see first time for the ones who did not see it so far, a so-called train. So what is happening here in this uh, little uh, typewriter uh, uh, picture, hello Nicole. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> no you see training. Training just means you have a big parameterized family of functions. These are these affine maps where actually the Matrix is uh, not known. You can choose the matrix such that it uh, does the job. And also the, 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 the constant part of the affine map is not known. So you can, what is happening here, you are adjusting these affine maps and uh, in order that the training task, namely to associate to one of the 60,000 pictures the correct meaning that this is done perfectly. What you see here is something very funny, namely, this was a live calculation, so this was not something which was uh, done before, a live training task where actually I was adjusting the parameters of this parameterized family and I received an accuracy of 97% uh, in this very short uh, training time. So this means not only that on the 60,000 pictures I get the correct meaning of this uh, nonlinear map which I was constructing before, 
but also on 10,000 new pictures. This is a test uh, set on 10,000 new pictures. The meaning is with 97% uh, correct. So what is fascinating here, the first thing is actually that it works so quickly, that it is possible to construct a map from a 900-dimensional space to 10 points, which in this short amount of time gives the correct uh, outcome on the 60,000 pictures. And even if I give 10,000 new pictures, it also performs relatively well. So this is the first fascinating thing. And you should just, uh, tonight, when you go home in the nature and maybe uh, have downloaded that, just appreciate that, how fascinating it is that this works so quickly. Yes, please. I have a question. In the training, the accuracy is only 92%? Yes. Because this is an average accuracy. At the beginning, uh, the, 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 uh, it starts with 10%. It has nothing to do with the set, and then this is an average calculate. This is not the last one. If you were calculating the, uh, at the end of the training, the accuracy would be about 99. But if you calculate the average, it's 93. So first, it works very quickly. This is the first fascinating thing. The reason why it works so quickly is, uh, on the one hand, that we use the best technology which is available. This is using in the background TensorFlow. TensorFlow has been developed by Google and they tried to make an optimal training technology which is available to each of you here by just uh, using this package. So this is one aspect why it works so quickly. It is a very good technology which is used. But there are also other aspects and I want to speak about that. You might ask uh, here at this point, Joseph, you are, you are, you are fitting a parameterized uh, family to a uh, couple of points which you know. So through those points, it's a sort of interpolation task. How many parameters does the family have? You might ask this just for curiosity. And I show you what the number of parameters is. The number of parameters is 607,394. At this point, as a, a well-educated person in the year 2019, you should tell me, Joseph, you're crazy. This is really crazy. You're taking a family which is parameterized by 607,000 open parameters in order to uh, represent uh, the values of a function on 60,000 pictures. This is almost the size of the the, the training data set itself, so it is uh, 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 a ridiculously over-parameterized uh, family which you use in order to do a certain task. And additionally, this uh, family of parameterized function does not have much to do with the data set, so it is a very generic thing. So the first and really um, um, perturbing, uh, disturbing fact is that we use a family of functions parameterized by 600,000 parameters in order to do a certain task, a training or a, a machine learning task, and we are able to choose those 600,000 parameters in such a way and in an extremely short time, such that uh, uh, with 97% of accuracy, we actually get a, a correct result. So at this point you might say, uh, what is this magic uh, tensorflow? How does it do that? How is it possible that actually you can adjust 600,000 parameters which have nothing to do with the problem, no pre-training, just um, at the beginning you have 10% uh, 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 accuracy or success rate, which is uh, just the success rate of a random uh, choice of the meaning. How is it possible that it does it so quickly and uh, How does that work? Yeah. Um, yeah. How pictures look like where you um, <coughs> so they can be relatively complicated. For instance, this is a six. And 
uh, it's not always that the technology recognizes uh, it correctly, but it is fascinating also to see that the technology fails usually when as we as human beings fail. So you might feel a little bit touched when you see where actually this uh, trained network uh, fails, because you yourself could also have uh, failed probably on this uh, uh, recognition. So, how is that possible to do that so quickly, and uh, what are we actually doing here? When you think a little bit back to your courses in mathematics, or in finance, or in physics, whatever your background is, you would say what is done here is first something very weird, something which is actually almost against the rules how we are trained. Mm -hmm. The rules how we are trained are saying if you have a certain interpolation task, and this is nothing else than an interpolation, you want to fit a function family to given points. If you have an interpolation task, you usually take a, a, a function family which has as little parameters as possible. This is uh, often called in science a principle which is Occam's razor. Occam's razor says if you have a simp simple model doing a certain task uh, and you compare it with a more complicated model doing a certain task, you choose the simple one. We have been trained like that. If you have a complicated stochastic process doing a certain uh, uh, modeling task in finance and you have the Black Scholes model and actually it does produce uh, very similar results, of course, you choose the Black Scholes one. We have been trained like that Occam's Racer. Simple is better. Which means, in terms of modeling, often you use parameterized families of functions, models parameterized by a low amount of parameters. What we are doing here is just the opposite. We take a ridiculously large amount of parameters, which is uh, uh, parameterizing our family. First, and second, what we have been trained in uh, mathematics or physics or finance is when you fit the model to data, when you calibrate the model, you do it with a very fine technology. You have to pay attention. Often these are non-convex optimization problems. You can land in local minima. You use fine technology in order to do that. And the whole field of inverse problems has been invented and studied in order to understand those uh, uh, calibration tasks well. What is done here is actually a relatively simple algorithm is used. The algorithm is called uh, stochastic gradient descent. So this is a sort of gradient descent, a blurry version of the gradient descent. You don't take the gradient of your of your loss function. You actually take a, a gradient plus a little bit of noise. But the noise you generate somehow by the uh, training data itself, so it's not an additionally uh, injected noise, it's a noise which comes from the training data set itself. So it's a relatively crude method, and as you saw it before, we let run this relatively crude method for an extremely short amount of time. It is not that we do what we have learned when you do calibration, that you do it for a long time, and you use a high power implementation in order to really find the minimum you do it here for a very short amount of time, and then you stop it. So you might say that you are actually doing two heavy mistakes from a classical science point of view. The first mistake is you over-parameterize the problem. You, to, you choose far too many parameters in order to do this uh, fitting uh, uh, task. And then you use a training technology, you use a calibration technology which is actually very crude and you early stop it. So you do early stopped crude calibration of a ridiculously overparameterized uh, 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 family of functions in order to do a calibration task. So these are two mistakes. What comes out finally is these two mistakes, not only that they seem to uh, give a superposition which is a good result, it's a result which is much better than expected. So there's something fascinating going on inside that, even though from a 
from a, from a scientific point of view, you seem to do two things in a very wrong way. You overparameterize the problem. As I was when I was uh, learning mathematical finance, people always said, if you use too many parameters in a model, you can fit an elephant. This was always the statement. Here, of course, you can fit an elephant. You can, and it would also work very quickly. Uh, but you can also fit any other function. Calibrate it. And second, use a technology which you stop very early. And uh, so, why is the result so good? That's a question I also hope I can uh, answer for you uh, during this day. And um, we will think about that from different, uh, from different angles. So, you saw now a first uh, working implementation of a machine learning task and now I would like to make a little excursion on what it is actually about. So what are those neural networks, what are those nonlinearities, why are they used and uh, what is the first main theorem which one has to understand in order to understand why neural networks are used. So this is the first thing I want to, I want to show to you and then we shall continue a little bit with uh, uh, implementations. So what I do here is not machine learning in the most general sense. I actually use machine learning mainly in order to approximate nonlinear functions. We do not do uh, big data here in the sense that I have uh, a more cloud of data that I would like to collect information about that or extract information which I don't have, you can use this technology for that, but this is not the point here. Here I really want to approximate nonlinear functions which are otherwise constructed by uh, uh, models of a classical numerical analysis technology. So what is behind this uh, approximation uh, task? There is a theorem which is called universal approximation theorem. And I want to speak a little bit about that uh, uh, with you in order to uh, make you feel comfortable with actually those uh, neural networks which you saw before uh, which do this approximation task. So what is a neural network? This is the first thing we have to understand. What is actually set up here as a model? As I said before, a neural network is uh, is uh, composition of functions, of two types of functions, two very simple types of functions. One type is an affine function, so this is a matrix applied to a vector plus a constant uh, uh, a vector, an affine function from a high dimensional space to another high dimensional space. This is one type of uh, object which appears here, and the other type is uh, nonlinearity. And the nonlinearities are actually very uh, simple, which are used here. These are functions from the real numbers to the real numbers, so from one dimensional space to one dimensional space, which you should imagine like the error function. So it interpolates between, let's say, 0 and 1, or minus 1 and 1, uh, time and hyperbolicus, such things you should uh, uh, imagine as those nonlinearities. How are they applied to a high dimensional vector? They are just applied component by component. So if you have a vector in R10, and the nonlinearity which we use here is just applied to each component one and the same nonlinearity, time and superbolicus first coordinate, second coordinate, and so on. So a neural network is nothing else than fn function, nonlinearity, fn function, nonlinearity, fn function, nonlinearity, and this is composed. This is a neural network. So you might ask, why that? Why do people use that? Uh, this goes back to the early days of digital computing. You remember in the 30s and uh, 40s, it started with uh, digital computing. People understood how to do uh, numerical tasks on, uh, on uh, electronic computers. And uh, it was very early that people asked whether one could mimic activities of the human brain also in digital computers. And uh, there were uh, 
two researchers, Mikhailov and Pitts, they were introduced in a, in a seminal paper from the 40s, I think 1943. Actually, what is today called uh, neural network, they give a little bit different name to it. They just said, uh, if you want to mimic activity of the human brain very roughly, you should imagine an uh, input vector of signals, some high dimensional input vector, for instance, such a matrix. This is also an input vector which is reaching your eye, and then your eye is uh, transforming those signals into your brain in order to finally get a meaning to it. So you have this high dimensional input vector, and each coordinate is called a node, and then you apply uh, transmissions of this information to other nodes where an activation happens or not. So this means you can imagine it like that. You have this uh, matrix of, uh, of uh, input signals. The transmission is modeled by this affine map and then you get the, after the, you apply the, the matrix, you end up in another high dimensional space at, again at nodes and you have numbers there. And the nonlinearity is saying nothing else. Is this neuron, this node, activated or not? So it says, for instance, if you have the error function, if the number there is very negative, then actually the output of this node after the application of the nonlinearity is zero. Or if it is a very large number, then it is one. And this is what people believe are, is roughly modeling what is happening in your brain. In your brain, you have this input you go through this transmission to the next nodes and then you either have zeros or ones depending on if it remains activated or not and then again a transmission, other nodes and so on you have these layers and layers of affine functions and non-linearities which uh, process the information up to a certain point where then the meaning is uh, uh, associated. So this was a very rough model of uh, brain activity and leading to the notion of neural networks. And it was then actually um, 40 years later uh, that uh, people were trying to answer the question whether neural networks have certain approximation properties. So the question, the mathematical question is the following. Give yourself a nonlinear function, a continuous nonlinear function, let's say on the unit cube in a high dimensional space, in RD, and ask whether you can approximate this function by a neural network. The uh, uh, parameters of the neural network are, uh, uh, you can choose them, so this means the affine function goes from your input space to a space of an arbitrary high dimension. You can use as many dimensions as you want. Then you have one fixed nonlinearity applied to all coordinates. And then you have an affine function taking this high dimensional vector and going to the output. So you only have once this composition structure, but you can use arbitrarily many nodes if you want. The question was actually, are such, is this? parameterized family of functions universally approximating or not? This was the question they asked in the 80s. And uh, two researchers, two groups of researchers independently could answer this question and the theorem which is coming out is called universal approximation theorem. So the statement is actually you can in the uniform norm, in the supremum norm, uh, on this compact set, approximate any continuous function by a neural network where you have an unknown but large amount of nodes and you choose the, the, the affine functions from the input into the nonlinearities and then from the nonlinearity output to the real numbers, you choose it. Uh, um, uh, in order to accommodate this, uh, this task. One of the researchers is Kurt Hornig. He is uh, in Austria, uh, who did uh, prove that. And it's uh, very funny because uh, 
um, uh, at that time when he did that, he did it for his PhD thesis, his uh, research was considered uh, not at all as interesting. So this was at the beginning of the 90s. People said uh, neural networks are interesting, but there are much better ways how to approximate the nonlinear functions. It was at the beginning of wavelet theory. And a lot of people in Vienna at this time actually were into this theory uh, doing wavelets, and only some were doing uh, these neural networks. And I remember uh, uh, there were people from the, from the wavelet group telling, this is uh, really crap research, these neural networks. There's no structure behind, nothing has to do with the, with the uh, uh, problems you're approximating, there are no convergence rates, it's actually not at all uh, an interesting type of research. The fashion at this time was to do it uh, with uh, uh, wavelet analysis and not going in the direction of uh, neural networks. And also, Kurt Honig, a couple of years later, he switched subject. So he went away from uh, neural networks and is now very much in statistics and still uh, uh, works there very successfully. Still, when you look at the uh, citations, it's fascinating. He's one of the most quoted Austrian researchers because, of course, this paper has, uh, uh, has uh, impact in the sense that it is usually every uh, machine learning paper, uh, one of these papers where this universal approximation theorem is proved is, uh, is uh, quoted. He works in soccer prediction. Yeah, also. When you say for the last <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's also one of the main developers of R. He's doing in that direction. Yeah. So the universal approximation theorem tells already when you have one, uh, one time this uh, funny composition of an FN map and the nonlinearity and then another FN map in order to come to the uh, real numbers, already this function family is dense in all continuous functions. We don't know how well it does approximate, so we don't have a convergence rate. We don't know how to find the affine functions, but we know that for any type of nonlinearity which is satisfying some very weak uh, 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 hypothesis, uh, actually you have this uh, universal approximation. So that's the first uh, building block, which is, we would say, mathematically speaking, uh, the same statement as that the weak closure of the convex set in a Banach space equals to the strong closure. And you can work it out uh, with this type of theorem very easy. It's a short proof. Um, so this explains, of course, only why we are using those uh, uh, functions here because they are universal in the sense that you can approximate any continuous function. I want to put your attention on one aspect which is uh, uh, important here and maybe I can write that down a little bit with my uh, technology here if it works out. So what is a neural network? It is nonlinearity. Let's give phi a name to the nonlinearity. You have an affine map. The matrix has uh, uh, lines which are those uh, alpha i. The input is x, beta, gamma, i, and let's say you have some delta here. So alpha i is the vector in Rd, beta i is a number, delta is a number, gamma i is a number, and actually you want to have a map which maps x. This is an element in the unit cube in Rd to the real numbers. And let's say phi, just for uh, 
to fix uh, to fix it, you can think phi equals phi to the root. So a function from R to N. So this would be a one hidden layer neural network, and what is the universal approximation theory telling? For any continuous function on the unit cube, actually you can find alpha i, beta i, delta, and gamma i such that you are approximating up to a given accuracy this nonlinear function by such a thing. What would you say is the advantage of this type of function? If at all there is an advantage of that with respect to uh, other approximating function families, like for instance uh, wavelets or Fourier basis, what is the advantage of that? What would you say? There is one obvious advantage. Hmm? Please. Um, it is simple to write it down. So you have this nonlinearity which goes from R to R and you have affine functions. Um, I want to put your eye on one uh, aspect. Do you see in the formula how I write it down the dimension? Actually, no. The dimension d of the space, even though it is implicitly there, does not appear in the formula. Imagine for a second you write down a similar formula for the Fourier basis. If you take the Fourier basis and you have a d-dimensional space, you actually have to take the one-dimensional Fourier basis everybody can write down, and then you have to, in each dimension, take this Fourier basis multiply, this tensorization. So actually, if you were writing down any sort of uh, uh, expansion with respect to this classical uh, uh, basis of uh, function spaces, you will always quickly see the dimension show up. The dimension showing up in the sense that uh, uh, in order to construct these basis uh, families, you usually make multiplications with respect to uh, uh, the number of dimensions. Here, Actually, this is not there. No. Phi is a function from R to R. You have this uh, 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 affine map. Of course, here, if you were writing it out, you have this color product of alpha i, a vector in Rd and x. So here you would see the dimension. But you actually don't have this product over different uh, basis uh, elements in the one-dimensional space in order to create something in the d-dimensional space. So there is a funny absence of dimension in at least the basic uh, approximation theory. This is the first aspect. What is the second aspect which I want to uh, uh, make you focus? Could you calculate the derivative very easy of this type of function? Yes. Yes, you could. Because you have to know the derivative of tangent superbolicus, um, <coughs> which you have probably learned since we're here in France already in the Ecole Maternelle. <laughs> but uh, uh, you have actually only to know how to take a derivative of the nonlinearity and the derivative of an affine function. The derivative of an affine function is easy. The derivative of a nonlinearity is one function where you have to know the derivative. Yeah? And uh, so it is very easy to calculate derivatives of such type of uh, uh, function. Two aspects. One aspect is uh, um, um, uh, funny absence of dimension in the formulation of the approximating family. And the second aspect, you can calculate derivatives relatively easily. When you compare the two wavelets, you see there is uh, differences. Even in the three case, it is similar there. It's also relatively easy to calculate derivatives. But the derivatives are uh, have a certain complexity. And you feel that also here, the complexity is actually not increasing. Just to say it, when you take the deep network, so deep means that you repeat this procedure, affine, nonlinear, affine, nonlinear. You repeat it more than once, that you have two or more layers where nonlinearities are applied. This is then called the deep network in contrast to such a thing which is called a shallow network, mm -hmm. shallow and deep. Even if you have a deep network, it is very easy to calculate uh, uh, derivatives. 
because you just have by the chain rule to calculate the derivatives of the shallow one and then you insert it into each other. So there are two aspects which you might find interesting. One is the absence of pieces. Yes, may I ask a question because in the formula of the uh, universal approximation you say that there is no parameter which appears. Yeah. Does that mean first that we could use as many parameters as we want? Yes, you and can. And does that mean another question? Yeah. Uh, we will avoid the overfitting of the polynomial function because when we use polynomial function to approximate a non-linear phenomenon in economics, like yeah. training, there is a problem of overfitting. Do in that question, if we don't have parameter, a number of parameters here, but there will be no overfitting problematic in neural networks, you would like say, the polynomial approximation. You would say, of course, there should be the problematics of overfitting, and there is, from this point of view, it is absolutely unclear why it should not be the case. So mm. it's really not clear. And since I take so many open parameters and the n is so large, uh, uh, you would say, of course, you overfit. But the funny thing is, uh, actually, no, you don't do it. Uh, there is, this is mathematically open, why right? it is actually mm. not producing this phenomenon which classically you would have. This is what I meant before Occam's Racer. You should not take two overparameterized families, uh, parameterized families of functions because otherwise you just overfit and you get uh, a perfect fit on your training data and otherwise nothing. You get a perfect fit on the training data but you get also generalization properties. So when you extrapolate mm. it works very well. Not so clear why. I will speak about that. Um, I want to make one mathematical connection which you should also appreciate here. There was uh, Paris, we are in Paris, Paris. 1900, so about 119 years ago, there was this International Congress of Mathematics in Paris where David Hilbert gave a talk on 23 problems. And one of the problems which uh, David Hilbert, uh, which one? the problem number 14, problem number 14 was the following question, can you represent a family, can you represent a nonlinear function of three variables as a composition of functions which only have as input two variables? So this was a question from algebraic geometry, you have functions of three variables, are you able to write it as a funny composition of functions of two variables? It was uh, one of those problems of Hilbert, and this problem was actually solved uh, about 60 years later, at the beginning of the 60s, by our dear uh, founding father of uh, probability theory and stochastic uh, uh, calculus, Kolmogorov. And one of his students, uh, Arnold, who was also a professor in Paris, uh, uh, I think in Dauphin. Uh, funny also because Arnold was the student of Common Grove, but of course they published independently. So <laughs> we were in competition <laughs> in this problem. And they solved the problem, and the, the, the solution is actually any nonlinear function even on a d-dimensional space can be not only approximated, it can be represented uh, by compositions and sums of functions of one variable. Yeah? When you look at the neural network, a neural network actually does precisely that. Here you have function of one variable, this is multiply the component of the vector with a number, this is a function of one variable, it gives another value. Then you have a function of one variable, the nonlinearity, and you have sums. But that's it. The statement of the kolmogorov arnold theorem says the only non-trivial function which you have from R, D to R, is actually the sum. Everything else can be written by functions of one variable and composing it. So it's also one aspect you should see in neural networks. Take this uh, Kolmogorov-Arnold uh, theorem very uh, seriously by just saying the only thing I have to do is to take sums of functions of one variable in order to represent or to approximate any function of more than one variable. 
That's a connection you should see a little bit here. But the important things are absence of dimension and uh, easy to handle when it comes to calculating derivatives. When it comes to calculating integrals, not easy to handle. Just as you say, derivatives. Okay. So this is the uh, universal uh, approximation uh, theorem, and it is just saying. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. May I ask another question? Uh, do we see the general function of the Sibenko theorem? Because the original Sibenko theorem, there is a, a neural network with only one hidden layer. Yeah. That could be infinite, and that could solve a, any problem. Could you say that with that formula, we could say that the Sibenko theorem has been demonstrated for a multiple layer neural network? Or, um, the, 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 the original form, uh, in, in it's or only one layer. There is only one layer, yeah. but it could be infinite. Um, no, no. Not so, but very high. High, yeah. yes. But yeah. in practice, high could be difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is nothing about the quality of approximation set except that you, uh, you, you, you get up to a given accuracy close, and uh, if you do that on a on a finite uh, training set. You don't know what happens outside mm -hmm. of this training data set. And uh, Ornick's, Ornick's theorem is also for one hidden layer. Yeah. In fact, Sibenko and Ornick, uh, it's almost the same. It's almost the same. One is for the uniform norm, the other one is for AP yeah. norms. Mm -hmm. Ornick has approved it for derivatives that you can simultaneously okay. approximate the derivative, but it is more or less the same. It is one hidden layer you can approximate, but you don't have a convergence rate and you don't have a construction how to get those guys there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just an abstract statement, a density statement of the set of five, not more. Yeah? And it is also not talking about uh, deep networks when you have more than one layer, because uh, this is only this is the minimal statement. You have yeah, yeah. you only need one hidden layer. There is no hypothesis about the structure of the neural network. Because there is no hypothesis about the structure. There is only summation and uh, and parameters. Yes, that's all. Yeah. But this formula is for density, not for the equality of the... Equality. It's for density, yes. It is also a difference. It's a universal approximation theorem. It's not a universal representation theorem. Whereas... Of is representation, but not for this kind of function. Right. The functions are a little bit more complicated. In the case of Komodorov, and of course, then the functions depend on the function you want to actually represent. Where here, you have only the nonlinearity fixed. And what is uh, where I is the gamma i and the alpha and the beta. So in this in this respect, n tends to be the yes. yes. Now let me show you something which might now be the the third uh, thing which makes you a little bit questioning what is going on here. So before I showed this missed task, I trained the network in order to represent the meaning of a handwritten digit correctly. I took the network, has a little bit of depth. I have actually three nonlinearities here, so a, a layer of, uh, of uh, three uh, uh, hidden layers I have uh, here, not only one. It's not a shallow network here. You see here one aspect which I did not mention before, namely there is the aspect of trainability. Trainability means nothing else, what you would expect, that you can change the affine function. You can adapt the values of the affine function uh, uh, in order to do the training cast. So and what is here, actually every affine function which I have in this uh, layer 3 neural network can be trained. I always have the trainability put to true. No? Now I do something which so before I told you uh, I have a ridiculously over-parameterized uh, uh, function family. Now I set one of the layers in the middle of this network to non-trainable. So this means I have a neural network, I have my input, then I have a trainable fn function, non-linearity, uh, non-trainable affine function, so the affine function is fixed, 
and actually it will be randomly chosen, non-linearity, then something trainable, and then out. Uh, let me initialize this thing. Just that you see here in the model summary, we changed something. So here, again, the number of parameters is the same, but the number of trainable parameters is now, in comparison to the 600,000 which we had before, now it is very low. It's 1,570. In comparison to the 600,000, you would say, uh, wow, now very small. 605,824 parameters are non-trainable. So they are fixed from the beginning, I don't train them. Let's look what the network does now if I do the same task. So this was actually one of my starting points in machine learning when I did that first time, and I did it, I think, actually only by chance. Uh, what do you see? This is the accuracy. When you remember before, the accuracy was actually increasing very quickly, but it was not uh, 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 immediately at the 90%. So as you hear, the accuracy goes up. Let's look how it performs on the test data. 90% accuracy. So even though we have chosen a part of the network random, I choose a random matrix in the middle of the network. You would say, I do what I actually looks a little bit funny now. Before I said universal approximation means that you can choose the, 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 the affine functions such that you fulfill a certain training task, and now I say one of those affine functions I actually fix, it's a random matrix, and still it works. It does not work as good as before, but it works relatively good. So this is the last aspect of, the, of this introductory part which I want to bring to your attention, even though we use a very highly parameterized family of functions, Randomness in the uh, uh, choice of the matrices which uh, produce the neural network actually already produces expressiveness. Okay. Let me ask you a question. I'm not sure to understand. Does it mean that whatever the geometry of the hidden layer, I will obtain a quite relatively good training on my set? Does it mean that? I, um, it's not only the geometry, it is also the, the, the weights, so the effort. Whatever the weight of, the, of the each neural of each It's subject. not whatever, it has to be random. It has to be random. Random. Yeah. So one layer was here chosen randomly. Okay. And this is a theme I want to put into the, also in the focus of your attention. What is the role of randomness mm -hmm. in this... Uh, in this uh, approximation task. This might be also a key to understand how it actually works to do such a high dimensional calibration task. If you look for 600,000 parameters in order to, to do a certain job and uh, you only calibrate for a very, very short time. Maybe it is like that, that the training does less calibrating than we believe each other. It, it just, or rather, produces, uh, or it stays close to initial values which you choose for your uh, training procedure, and the initial values are actually chosen as random matrices. So I wanted to, push, to point that out, that actually the random starting points which are chosen for the networks, they are much more important than one beliefs, and the training does probably something very different then we actually would believe from a theory of uh, uh, inverse problems or from a low dimensional view on uh, uh, inverse problems. We also spoke about that yesterday. Our intuition as human beings is very much trained from a low dimensional point of view. When we think of optimizing, you have a function in dimension one, you see extrema, local minima, local maxima, you cannot imagine that the, just the gradient descent allows you to find the global minimum of a function by searching it very shortly. And we all believe when the dimension gets higher, it gets more complicated. Apparently, 
uh, high dimensional optimization problems have actually a different structure and one of the structures one sees here that uh, the, uh, the, stru the search algorithms even though they are very crude already find good solutions of such inverse problems in a relatively short amount of time which is an effect which on the one hand has to do with geometry of high dimensional optimization problems and on the other hand also with random starting points and this is what I wanted to uh, make uh, uh, visible uh, for you here Is it also possible that the, the, the space of pictures you are working at, uh, on does not fill the entire space you are Yes That's why you are, in fact, you can focus on yeah. the trench of this space also, a very important uh, uh, strand of research. When you look at the pictures as a subset of uh, this 900 dimensional space, it is precisely what our colleague said, it is actually covering a relatively low dimensional uh, um, subset there. What do we not know? We don't know how is the geometry of the subset, what is the dimension of the subset, if at all there is a dimension, and how does it lie in space? What neural networks funnily do is that they are very innocent about solving such tasks. So if you were, for instance, doing wavelets in order to approximate it, you need to understand a little bit the geometry of the guy, and then you locate the wavelet basis around this uh, uh, geometric uh, object where you're training data, and then you make an expansion. Neural networks actually do this task for you without uh, that you at the beginning have to specify how the geometry of this thing looks like. So this is also an implicit uh, um, um, uh, adjusting of, the, of this neural network basis such that you don't need to code at the beginning the geometry of the data set into your, into your computer code. And you see that as we here, it starts very, uh, I mean, this is a completely generic implementation. This has nothing to do with the data at this point. And you have also randomly chosen matrices. And even if you don't train them, you get relatively well uh, approximating uh, function families. So these are some aspects I wanted to bring uh, to your attention at the beginning of this um, I have a question. Please. What's the difference between making a layer not trainable and removing the layer? Um, mathematically speaking, the difference is that you have uh, one random affine operation in the middle of this uh, neural network. If you were removing it, you have uh, you don't okay, have this so, random operation so, here. So, so the layer exists. Yeah. The matrix product plus yeah. uh, bias exists, but it's not. Like yes. Oh. Yeah, it's not removed. It is there, yeah. operating, and with a random matrix. Okay. When you say random matrix, is the randomness of the weight of the neural network? No, it's the randomness of the. At, at the inception of the. the <laughs> Let me show it to you in some. <coughs> detail and then I want to come to a little bit of mathematical theory there. So as I said, neural network takes input fn function nonlinearity another fn function Non-linearity and so on. Yeah, and one of those affine functions is chosen randomly before when I put it non-trainable. I choose here a random matrix and a random bias. This is called bias, whatever it is, with uh, a standard Gaussian. Yeah. So let me come now a little bit more into mathematical details um, and as we explaining this phenomenon and putting a certain point of view uh, 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 on this 
this whole structure, a point of view which, by the way, is also relatively new. When you see such a thing, you would say, uh, this reminds you of something. So it is a composition of one and the same operation over and over again, and this produces depth. Yeah? Um, when do we have a composition of one and the same operation again and again um, in your everyday life as, uh, as quants, as mathematicians, where do we have this phenomenon? For instance, when we solve a differential equation, when you solve a differential equation by the Euler scheme, you have a starting point and you apply the vector field at the starting point and you add to the vector field applied to the starting point, the initial point, and you multiply so the vector field by the time increment. And then you do this operation again and again and again in order to approximate the solution of the ordinary differential equation. So when you have a dynamical system, you often have this one and the same op operation is applied again and again. One should see neural networks actually as dynamical systems where time is representing depth. So you can see it like that, you start at a point, you apply an affine function and a nonlinearity, you end up in a, at another point, and then you do that again and again and again. There's a little caveat here which one has to see, but I want to, the number of nodes should stay the number of uh, input dimension, input dimension analysis. So imagine for a moment that we are looking for special neural networks, namely neural networks where you actually have the number of nodes is always equal to d. Mm -hmm. But they can be arbitrarily deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you would say, okay, a neural network now reminds me of something It is actually like a dynamical system, where depth corresponds to time. The question is, can we make with that point of view a little bit of uh, philosophy of understanding why neural networks approximate so well. The first thing I want to talk a little bit more in detail about, first I want to show you, I want to put your attention on one, to one paper. There's this paper with Christa and Martin Larsson. This is called Deep neural networks, generic universal interpolation, and controlled ordinary differential equations. And this paper tries to model neural networks actually as solutions of ordinary differential equations where time corresponds to depth. And then we use a little bit theory of dynamical systems in order to understand the role of randomness. To know Ordinary differential equations with random vector fields have particular properties, and we will analyze uh, this relationship. So this is this paper. If you want to know it in detail, take a look there. It's a funny appearance of, uh, uh, of geometric reasoning uh, in order to understand that, and I will talk in the uh, next half an hour a little bit about that. So this is this lecture number two. I take the following point of view. I look at an ordinary differential equation. I write it in this uh, stochastic analysis heavy, so I don't write the derivatives. I just write the differentials. But what is meant here is the integral equation. What are the? What is the meaning here? So x is an element in R d. This is running in some d-dimensional space or m-dimensional space, as I have it here. V i is a vector field, so this is a map from R m to R m. And the U is a so-called control. Uh, I will always refer to it as control, but uh, uh, not uh, um, um, explain at the beginning why I uh, see it. I say it like that. You will see it in the when I develop my thoughts here uh, why we actually call it like that. And so we look at this ordinary differential equation. And we assume enough regularity, so let's assume that the u is a finite variation curve. The vi, the vector fields, are, let's say, c infinity and global ellipsoids. Then we know that actually we have a global solution of this uh, uh, controlled ordinary differential equation, controlled by the control u, and having d um, vector fields in which you can move. 
Yeah? So this is a controlled ordinary differential equation. And what is meant here, as I said before, it is just uh, this integral equation. Yeah? So what does that have to do with neural networks? Very easy. You just imagine it like that. Imagine that this curve here, I said this is a finite variation curve. Imagine this is the simplest finite variation curve you can imagine. It is constant, and then it makes a jump by 1. And then it is constant again. If you solve such an equation with such a curve, you actually stay all the time at x until the jump appears, and then you apply once the vector field. And now choose the vector field of such a neural network type. So actually you have then represented a shallow neural network as a solution of an ordinary differential equation. And if you have more jumps, the network is getting deeper. In that sense, time corresponds to uh, the, the, the number of uh, hidden layers you have. And now you make it more abstract. You just say, let us analyze ordinary differential equations controlled by finite variation path in order to understand why deep networks are actually expressive. Expressive means they are able to represent uh, nonlinear functions, arbitrary nonlinear functions, by choosing the vector fields. So these are this uh, uh, neural network type vector field, and maybe also the controls appropriately. So this brings now my my uh, universal approximation result actually into a word which we which we are we know a little bit the word of solutions of ordinary or even stochastic controlled differential equations. <laughs> flows of those equations and the question which functions can be approximated by such guys. This is now a mathematical question. Uh, so this is a translation of, the, of, uh, of uh, thinking about deep neural networks translated into the language of dynamic systems. Mm -hmm. yeah? I'm, we are, of course, not the first ones having this thought. If you listen carefully to the lectures of Pierre-Louis Lyons, uh, he mentions that, but uh, I think it's never, or at least I'm not aware of uh, papers of him where it was uh, worked on. I'm also not too sure if he was uh, very interested in this universal approximation result. And also in computer science, from time to time, you see papers there where they actually say, well, this is a dynamical system, depth is time. Mm -hmm. So we are not the first one having this thought, by far not. We are probably the first ones asking the question, what happens if I fix the vector fields here and I choose them randomly? And I only train the control. Can we still express any nonlinearity with that? This was the question which we asked uh, uh, ourselves. But first, just first, to, uh, before I enter into that question, let me come to one interesting point here which is, at least I find it uh, uh, beautiful and important. Uh, you see, um, we connect now neural networks with uh, solutions of controlled ordinary differential equations. We know training of neural networks is an inverse problem, and in order to solve the inverse problem, you use a sort of gradient descent. Gradient with respect of a loss function, where you insert a neural network gradient with respect to the parameters of the network. The parameters of the network are the matrix and the bias. The nonlinearity is fixed. So you have to calculate actually the gradient of the network with respect to those parameters. In computer science, the algorithm of choice there, I mean, there's not much uh, to say. This is uh, 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 a way how to write down uh, the chain rule efficiently is called back propagation. That is a name back propagation. And I find it particularly beautiful how you can write down the back propagation algorithm in this setting. There are a couple of papers in computer science where uh, actually the back propagation algorithm is explained for different architectures uh, because the way how they write it down actually is a little bit suboptimal, and therefore you have to write it again and again in order to convince yourself that you do the right thing. I want to convince you, if you have this dynamical system point of view, 
backpropagation can be written in one line first, and second, you will never again use a different notation. It's also one of the examples where you say a good mathematical theorem also comes with the correct notation. If the notation is good, it is a piece of cake. If it is bad, even a simple fact can be uh, overshadowed by bad notation. So this is also something which I invite you to do uh, tonight. Take any paper on uh, backpropagation in a complicated recurrent neural network and look how uh, this is written down if you use a bad notation. And compare it with this notation, you will see you will always use them. So what is backpropagation? Backpropagation is very simple. It is just calculating the derivative Sorry. No. I should. Yeah, here it is. You calculate the derivative of an ordinary differential equation with respect to a parameter of the vector field. Now, this we have learned maybe in France, not in Ecole Maternelle, but a little bit later. Uh, this is, of course, uh, applying. Uh, the chain rule, but in an uh, intelligent way, so you have to define, uh, yeah, take the derivative here, and if you want to take the derivative with respect to this parameter theta, you actually take the derivative of the whole dynamic system. This means you take the derivative with theta, respect to theta here, and then you take the derivative with respect to the state variable, and then the derivative with respect to theta. This gives a linear equation for the derivative with respect to this parameter with an inhomogeneity. The linear equation takes the derivative with respect to space, and this linear equation usually has a name. I learned it first time, I think, when I did my Lyon calculus. There it is called the uh, first variation equation. It is just uh, often referred to as the Jacobi uh, equation. There are different names in different areas. It is just an equation which says what happens if I change the input variable a little bit with the solution of the dynamical system and it is very known that it satisfies such a type of equation. So this is this J operator, the Jacobi operator, the first variation operator. The first variation operator appears here and in order to calculate now the solution, the uh, how to calculate the gradient of this dynamical system with respect to the parameter theta, you take the solution of the linear equation and apply it to the, to the inhomogeneity. So therefore the back propagation algorithm then reads precisely like that. This, one this is the whole back propagation algorithm. You have the linear operator and you apply it to the inhomogeneity. Why is it called back propagation operator? Uh, back propagation algorithm. The reason is you back propagate. You see here, uh, you have this J operator and you have the, uh, the solution of the dynamical system which corresponds to the neural network. What you first do, you take an input you calculate through all the layers and get an output. This is the forward direction. And then you go backwards. Along this output, you go along all the layers backwards. You have to read this integral actually from t to zero. And you are just going backward. You see it here, this, the, 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 this variable is the integration variable. You start with the identity here. You have the first derivative with respect uh, of the vector field with respect to theta, of the last layer, and then you go once back, once back, once back, and you get a longer and longer sum, and this is the way how you write down uh, the algorithm. So you go forward through the network, and then you calculate backward in order to get the derivatives. And that's the way how you write it down. And this, of course, holds for any type of complicated architecture you can imagine in any sort of uh, network you have you always have this type of uh, formula uh, valid, and this is uh, uh, easy to implement. Yes? Well, in the integral, you don't put uh, from t to 0, you put it from 0 to t. If yeah. you're really in back propagation, it would be better to, to integrate on the other side. It's 
for inheritance. I don't understand why there is back propagation in the formula. Because uh, this is uh, forward propagation from 0 to t. Oh, because the st. Because the st is g or st. This is uh, g. Okay. You use the back pro the, the back the back propagation from the g from, from the, the g. Um, let's assume we calculate the derivative of the ODE representing the neural network with respect to the last layer. So this is what happens okay. at the very end. If I take this derivative, then I calculate the derivative of the vector field with respect to this variable. This is the variable at the very end. This means only this derivative is uh, non-zero here. And therefore, I only have the end of the integral contributing to that. Then I go one layer deeper, okay. and so on. And so you okay. see it from the end. Like that. But you also see this operator here, which starts at the identity and goes down backwards. Yeah. So that's a very cute way how to write down backpropagation algorithm and I really invite you to look once in the computer science literature how this is written down. It's the same thing but looks a little bit more uh, complicated because the notation is uh, different features. So this is one important aspect which uh, I wanted to introduce to you. One should try to understand neural networks actually as dynamical systems. And if you understand them as dynamical systems, you have the advantage that you can write uh, the back propagation algorithm by classical technology for dynamical systems. How do you take the derivative with respect to a parameter? Yeah. Um, okay. Now, one mathematical question. Um, we can try to ask ourselves at this point. So imagine you have um, a neural network with a lot of hidden layers, so a very deep neural network, which corresponds in our setting to a certain dynamic uh, system where you have uh, finitely many jumps, this is the number of hidden layers, and you have here the vector fields representing precisely the layers. Now, we have before the phenomenon, and as uh, Olivier was referring to it, what happens if I choose one of the layers, random but fixed, in the setting of, of, uh, of uh, uh, dynamical systems, this would mean you choose one of those uh, vector fields random. Yeah? Can you still, can you still um, approximate nonlinearities, arbitrary nonlinearities by that? The answer is first, now yeah, actually, no. I mean, the U is fixed. Let's say the vector field is a fixed random vector field. What you get out is then just a random dynamical system. So you have to, you have to keep some things. Uh, controllable in order to uh, to allow for uh, approximation property. And we take here the lowest amount of uh, number of controls which you can imagine. We say the only thing which I control here is actually this curve U. So this means that in every layer the curve uh, contributes the jump size and this is actually a finite number of uh, of uh, a, friend, a small number, then d contributes d uh, numbers, and I ask, actually, is this uh, this dynamic system can it approximate any nonlinear function if I choose the random if I choose the vector fields random, not time dependent, fixed, and I only control the u. Is this possible? This would, in a way, answer the question why actually random choices of layers still produce relatively expressive structures. And therefore, we were interested in this question. So the question, mathematical question is not very easy. Take a random vector field V. Theta is fixed. Some uh, uh, random uh, numbers are chosen here. And only allow the control to vary can we still approximate nonlinear functions 
from Rn to Rn, arbitrary nonlinear particle system. Yes. Let's translate this question into a question of dynamical systems. What is training in the world of dynamical systems? If you see it like that, training means that you have finitely many points x1 up to xl, and you want to move those points to other points, namely the target points, and the dynamical system has to be like that, that it actually moves L points with the main tag to L other points. A training task works if you can do that. Yeah? So in that sense, I translate now training in the world of dynamical system of transporting one point cloud of named particles to another point cloud such that the names match. And I give myself the restriction that the vector fields are random and I only control the U. Can that work? This is the first question. And we were thinking about this question relatively long and finally came up with the following uh, solution. A little bit surprising solution. So, uh, you can take the state space of an arbitrary dimension. M can be any number. You can choose the D equal to 2. So you only have two random vector fields here. Nonlinear they have to be. But the nonlinearity is of such a neural network type. Two random vector fields with a nonlinearity. And you actually have only at each layer two numbers which you inject which you, this is your control, then you can prove that actually uh, if the number of jumps, if the number of layers is arbitrary, you can approximate any um, training task for which is given through finitely many points. So it is not a universal approximation theorem in the sense that you can approximate any continuous function from Rm to Rm, it just says if I give myself points x1 up to xl, target points y1 up to yl, I can find a control such that the points x1 up to xl are moved by this dynamical systems to y1 up to yl. And the control is of such a type and the vector fields can be chosen randomly. So this explains a little bit that the role of randomness actually in this, uh, in this uh, training task is much uh, stronger than we believe. What does randomness actually create here for the mathematicians uh, uh, in the room? Randomness creates that the vector fields are not commuting in the sense of Lie brackets. So when you calculate the leap brackets of those vector fields, you get, with probability 1, a new direction. And when you calculate the third leap bracket, you get always new directions. Therefore, it means that in the, in the, in the, in the set of, uh, of uh, solutions of such equations, you actually move in space in all possible directions with probability 1 if the randomness is chosen uh, with the density, let's say. And this phenomenon we exploit, we use uh, subgroup in geometry, the Chow theorem um, from, the, from the 40s, beautiful theorem, chow rashevsky theorem, telling <coughs> classically that if you have enough Lie brackets available of a certain dynamical system, you can move from a starting point x actually to any point in this space if you have enough Lie brackets of the system and a certain regularity there. Here we do not only have one point, we have L points, so we have to generalize this Chow theorem in a certain direction, but actually it uh, works and the contents can be found in this paper. So this is one explanation why when you have deep neural networks and you have some random layers, you can imagine it like that, that the uh, Randomness creates uh, expressiveness, creates new directions in space which you uh, need in order to accommodate certain uh, training tasks which you, which you have. And the theorem also tells that uh, actually a low amount of, uh, of uh, um, 
trainable, controllable parameters is sufficient to, uh, to achieve a certain training task. It is just a theoretical result to explain in one respect the role of, of uh, randomness in uh, neural networks. Yeah? <coughs> Just a question, but it would explain the randomness of every system in genetics, in, a, in a genetic programming, etc. When you create noise in the system, you could express this is Hayek theory in economy or something like that. It's not only for the neural network, no, it's for no, all uh, it's whatever system. For many systems, and randomness produces generic functions, and those generic functions are actually. Uh, uh, extremely good basis mm -hmm. for regressions, to put it in a, a language yeah. of statistics. Or, yeah, or statistics, yeah. or, gen or genetic programming, yeah. or something like that. Absolutely. It is a general statement talking about the role of randomness in creating mm -hmm. good basis to approximate. Please, me just China. I want to be sure that, uh, so now uh, for this uh, part of uh, randomness, uh, what you are choosing, because now you are controlling you, yeah. So you are not choosing not really the parameters, but no. you are choosing something that is close to the architecture. Because you is the time you last you, in. You, what is you? I mean, you can imagine if you take a... Uh, uh, imagine it has only one jump here. Yeah. The jump appears at time one. So this means this, uh, the solution of the equation is log, the identity, the identity, then the jump comes, and then you have one layer. Mm -hmm. And the u is nothing else than the size of the jump. So this means you multiply the outcome of the shallow neural network by a number. It's like a scaling factor. Just a simple scaling factor. It is not the architecture. It is just you do not train the whole uh, matrix. You just train a number which is multiplied on a random matrix. And you need the field not to be autonomous. You need T in VI. So uh, it means that you have a scaling factor in your parameter? No, actually, yes, I will not use it. For the, for the result, I don't need the time dependence. Like when we were explicitly going uh, beyond time dependence. So we have fixed vector uh, uh, fields. It's, uh, it's non autonomous only through the control, mm -hmm. not through the vector fields. So, an applied question it means that if we believe in that formula, if we have sufficient data, we could also use it for temporal theory in economics or uh, for the stock exchange. You will uh, see that in the afternoon. Mm. Yeah. Of course, such a thing, such a thing needs an implementation. Otherwise, we don't believe it. Or at least I, as, as a mathematician like that, um, before we had the task of learning um, the meaning of handwritten digits and we did it with the, this implementation which you can find on the internet. This is one of the 100,000 implementations for the handwritten digits with this three-layer neural network. This works well. Now I claim it also should work with a dynamic system. First, uh, it is a way how to use Keras which was uh, not uh, foreseen by the founding fathers. But f of course, uh, uh, um, um, since I think this technology is very good, I asked myself, is it easy in Keras to, to, to write a, a, a neural network as a dynamic system? And when you look into the documentation of Keras, you actually get uh, relatively quickly mm, rather a no. But I was experimenting a little bit, and after some time, I found a very funny functionality of Keras, which allows me to super easily write dynamic systems within this technology. I just wanted to, to uh, for the ones who do a coding a little bit, to, to show this aspect to you. So what I do here is I make a list of layers. So layers are just affine function nonlinearity. I make a list of layers, but they do not specify the input dimension. I just say the output dimension. So abstractly, Keras is able to talk about layers, even though there is one really open variable, namely the input dimension. Yeah? So I have this abstract list of layers, and then I say I want to make a dynamic system. How do I do that? The dynamical system 
yeah, let me write it here like that. I have my control U which enters and um, so the input is on the one hand the, the, the x, the state variable, and then I have my control U also as an input. And what is funny with Keras, you can make a sort of dynamic uh, adaptation of the input dimension. You don't have to fix it at the beginning. You can dynamically, within a for loop, add more and more input dimensions. These are just the increments of my, of my control in order to write this dynamic system and to get with this little piece of uh, code here uh, a model which pre represents precisely a map from uh, Rm <coughs> to Rm which is controlled by a control U which I can uh, which I give the system and which I actually can also uh, train so the size of the jumps I can train and when you look at this model you can then run the same task here uh, again and you see actually um, not an outrageously good uh, number which appears here, but still a relatively good uh, accuracy which you obtain uh, with this uh, dynamic system uh, point of view here. Uh, uh, let's say um, implementation justification also saying that if you only train this control and if you choose the random vector fields once fixed you still have a relatively expressive uh, family of functions. Here, by the way, I have uh, depths, uh, I think, uh, 40. So it is a 40 uh, uh, layer uh, neural network. It's a dynamic system where you have finite variation mm -hmm. uh, curve which has 40 jumps. And the only thing which you train is actually the size of the jumps, so actually low dimensional uh, family. Still, you get relatively expressive distance. Yeah. What is that? The width, the number of neurons in the layer. Uh, I start here with a 400 dimensional space and I always go in this dynamic system perspective to the same dimension. So the width stays constant. Yeah, but how much? 400. Oh, so that's a very big uh, yeah. yeah, it's a super huge network. But the, render, the layers are chosen randomly. Fixed. Mm -hmm. So I don't train these matrices. I don't train these uh, 400 times 400 matrices. I just train a number which is multiplied on the matrix. So it is actually the number of trainable parameters is low, very low. I just wanted to underline the fact that randomness plays a very big role in the structure of networks. It is not so much that you can train the matrices in order to perform a certain task. It also is the fact that the matrices are chosen at the beginning random and that this by itself already creates its persistence. This was the point of view I wanted to bring here. Okay, uh, dear friends, I think we... Uh, I, would, uh, I would make a, a point in this Russian style lecture here and make a half an hour of a break here. And we have a coffee break here inside. I'm always criticized in Zurich that I don't make breaks. I have this Russian style approach, so I give one long lecture until the thought is finished. And the Swiss people always tell me after 45 minutes, you forgot again the break. Thanks for coming back. I, I take it as a good sign that you're still here. Um, let me wrap up a little bit what, uh, what happened in the first part of the lecture now with these slides. Then I show you uh, some code. And then at the end we shall approach uh, uh, an area where you all uh, will be uh, very comfortable. We shall do a hatching task by means of this uh, 
uh, machine learning technology, which we understood. This is the just before uh, the lunch break. But let me first uh, wrap up the point of view, which I try to bring uh, in the morning to you. So it was deep neural networks, generic, universal interpolation. We rather use this word than approximation because we are not approximating continuous function everywhere. We are giving a finite training data set, and in this finite training data set, actually, you can interpolate with these solutions of this uh, control ODEs uh, perfectly. Yeah. So you can see this, what I, want, what I presented, it's an optimal control theory point of view on deep neural networks, where we consider first deep neural networks as discretizations of certain controlled uh, ordinary differential equations, expressiveness, the ability to approximate by deep neural networks uh, nonlinear functions, will be uh, coded here or seen here in terms of uh, generic uh, universal interpolation and the main theorem is just randomly generated uh, vector fields actually generate generic expressiveness. So a large number of parameters can be left untrained and still one is able to uh, do uh, uh, training tasks. Well. So this was what I wanted to show in the morning. And just to give a little bit now, in the word of formulas, a representation, what I was more speaking in the morning. What is a feed-forward neural network? So this is, as I said, a composition of one building block. And the building block is an affine function and a nonlinearity. Usually, it is one and the same nonlinearity. Sometimes, I said the nonlinearity changes uh, for different layers. But in the basic theorems, you have one sort of nonlinearity, and you have for each t uh, a different uh, building block. Uh, this is a so-called feed-forward neural network. And just to fix the language, because I will use it uh, from now on very often, the last layer is usually chosen only a linear function, not a nonlinearity, or to say it, the nonlinearity is chosen to be the identity. And we often refer to this last layer as the readout, the readout layer, where I have the many hundred nodes and then I project it by application of a linear map, let's say, to a one dimensional or ten dimensional space. And the philosophy, what I tried to present in the morning, is actually like that. If you choose many of those layers here randomly, and you only train the readout layer, actually you already achieve relatively good uh, training uh, performance. This is, and in other words, you could say training only the readout layer is a simple regression, and choosing these layers, other layers, uh, randomly just means that you can, by neural networks and the random initialization, create very good regression basis. This is also a way how to see this, uh, uh, this structure. And what was the idea? The idea was, of course, uh, as I said in the morning, you consider vector fields of such a type. They are just uh, take this building block minus x, and then you can say, actually, the construction of a feedforward neural network is nothing else that xt is xt minus 1, you add layer t minus 1, and you add this vector field, which of course depends on some parameters and on the values you have achieved at time t minus 1. This is the dynamic <coughs> system point of view. Several people, as I said, have uh, done it like that, and then you can talk about actually as a controlled differential equation. Here, the control is chosen like time, but you can also choose it. Uh, 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 generate control. This is what I was uh, uh, talking about uh, in the morning. And then you can consider the problem of supervised learning. Supervised learning means nothing else that you have given points xi and yi. i goes from 1 to n, a finite number of points, and you want to start at the point xi with your dynamical system 
and reach by choosing the readout and choosing the control of the points yi. That's what happens. And in terms of this uh, controlled ordinary differential equations, this is now just the question, how expressive can such a structure be if the vector fields are chosen, let's say, randomly, let's say the number d is equal to 2, and the controls are the only thing which you control. How do the controls act on such a vector field? You can imagine it just as multiplication. It's a linear, uh, uh, infinitesimally linear combination of directions. But as uh, Charles Albert put it nicely, it is just you have d dynamics, d uh, uh, velocity fields, and you choose at each point in time a linear combination of those velocity fields, and in this direction you move. And then you can ask the question, how many directions do you need in order to achieve a generic training task, to move a cloud from, of points x1 up to xn to another cloud of points y1 up to yn, such that the indices match and the points are closed. Yeah. And the theorem which we were able to prove is then, let's put it, uh, I just want to uh, show it <coughs> here. This is one uh, theorem which we were able to prove. Now we have it already better. The first version is with five vector fields, but actually it works with two. The version with five has one little advantage, but actually it works with two. So we have an input space of dimension m greater or equal than two. And then there exist five smooth bounded vector fields, and uh, you can choose them of a, it's not written here, you can choose them of a type which is a shallow neural network, so it is just FI map composed with a fixed sort of nonlinearity such that if you start at the point cloud uh, with n points, you can reach any other point cloud y1 of 2 y l with an arbitrary precision, what we call then a universal endpoint interpolator on a set omega. This can be uh, proved, and this explains when you now uh, roll back a little bit, such dynamic systems correspond to deep neural networks. This explains that deep neural networks where most of the layers are chosen randomly and you only have scaling factors acting on these uh, 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 random layers, you are still expressive, which is explaining the role of randomness in some, uh, in some respect. OK, so this was one starting theorem which I wanted to bring uh, to your attention. A uh, new point of view, as I promised. Uh, I start on the one hand with the basics of machine learning, but I also wanted to show you some really uh, frontier of research, uh, what, we are, what we are doing in the working group. You remember, we in the morning I showed you first uh, the NIST uh, task here, how to... How to um, Build a network in Keras, which uh, by a training procedure represents the map from 60,000 pictures to the meaning of the pictures. Yeah. Here I take uh, the same again, and I just wanted to make some little comments that you understand a little bit better what is happening here. So you see already the model is sequential, so this means a feed-forward network. You start with a so-called convolutional layer here. What is a convolutional layer? This is an affine map from the space of matrices to another space of matrices, but it is a particular affine map. It is not a generic affine map, which is, let's say, any matrix. It's a particular matrix. It is a matrix which makes a convolution, so it is scanning through this big matrix picture, which is representing the digit, 
scanning through it with a low dimensional matrix and somehow averaging over a couple of uh, entries. And I think here you see it is a kernel size 3. So you take uh, 9, a matrix of 9 uh, entries plus 1, the bias gives 10 numbers and you are scanning through this uh, take this uh, nine dimensional thing and you are applying it to, uh, to a part of this big picture in order to average a little bit. It's like a, a, a blurring of the picture, averaging over the picture by zooming in and averaging there and this is actually what happens here in this very first layer so it's a very particular FIM map applied to this uh, to this um, uh, matrix, to this input matrix. Then uh, uh, maximization is happening, so here the nonlinearity is of a very special type. The matrix is flattened into a vector. Then a so called dense layer is applied, so this is now a generic affine map. And then we read out from the dense layer and apply a map from this 128 dimensional space to a 10 dimensional space and then we interpret the result of the network as saying the meaning of the output is 5 if this 10 dimensional vector has the largest value at 5, component number 5. Just that you see a little bit how the technology works. So I told you before, this is the network. Keras now has in the background the uh, network created. And here I have a model summary. The model summary tells me what are the parameters and what is actually happening. So the number of open parameters which can be trained, you find here to the right. And you see here these impressive uh, numbers. Let's try to understand those numbers, just for you, that you, when you see that, have a feeling. So how do we get the 280 here? The 9-9 matrix. 9 matrix plus a bias is 10, and I have uh, 28 dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it gives a 28 dimensional thing. So 26, 26, 28. You start with something 28 times 28, then you average a little bit, so this means you are reducing the matrix, you make it a little bit smaller, and you do that just with a, a, a matrix of size uh, 3 times 3, this averaging over uh, a sub part of the picture, and you add a bias, so this gives 9 plus 1 is 10, 28 times is 280 open parameters. Then you do the max pooling, this is a nonlinearity, there's no open parameter. Then you do the flattening, this is just flattening out the matrix into a vector, there's no open parameter. Then you have 605,824 <coughs> open parameters. How do we get that number? 200. Who has an idea about how this comes to existence? Multiplication of an addition. Say it again. That's the CRM. It's a multiplication plus an addition. Okay. <laughs> so I claim it is a linear map from a 4732 dimensional space to a 128 dimensional space plus a 128 dimensional vector. This is precisely how the number comes to existence. And how do the 4000 uh, 732 come to existence. This is precisely the dimension of that. When you multiply those numbers, you get precisely that. Yeah? Okay. How does the 1290 appear at the end? So this is a linear an FI map from a 128 dimensional space to a 10 dimensional space plus a 10 dimensional vector. So this is 128 times 10 is 1280 plus 10 is 1290. So these are all open parameters here. And this gives this uh, impressive number of 
607,394 open parameters, the ridiculously overparameterized family which I use for doing the training task. Now, how is the training done? What is precisely happening when you do the training? You have to choose a, a loss function telling you what does it mean to be close to your targets. The loss function here is has a name. Um, sorry. I see apparently a little bit more here on my screen that you can see. So the loss function is sparse categorical cross entropy. I don't go into detail what that precisely means, but let's just say this is an error criterion telling you how close are you to the target you would like to reach. You write it here really in language. There's a list of lost functions, you write it there, and then this is just done in the most simple way you can imagine. You take the network with some parameters, you insert you apply the network to the xi, this is the argument, uh, you look what comes out, and you compare that with the target. And then the loss function tells the loss is large, and then you try to make a gradient descent in order to get closer and closer. How is the gradient descent done? Calculate the gradient of the loss function with the network with respect to the network parameters. So this will give a vector of size in the 600,000, this is the gradient, and this gradient is calculated by back propagation. We saw the, the, the formula before, and this 600,000 dimensional gradient vector is then applied in the most simple fashion, as you can imagine, to, uh, to make a gradient descent with a little bit of blurriness. So, actually, you don't calculate the gradient precisely, you calculate a sort of uh, slightly blurred version of it. And the miracle is, this works. If you had seen that, let's say, 15 years ago, you would have said, this is not even wishful thinking that this should work. But it does. Reason, one of the reasons is randomness. Where is the randomness entering here in a standard implementation? The randomness enters as in terms of the initialization of the gradient descent. You start the gradient descent at a random point. And my claim is that actually you don't move far away. Why don't you move far away? Uh, because a 600,000 dimensional vector cannot only consist of non-zeros, otherwise its norm would mm -hmm. explode. So they are actually very small entries. And this means since you run your optimization, your calibration for such a short time, you're actually not moving far away from these random objects. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the random initialization plays a much bigger role than one, uh, one would believe. One aspect, one interesting aspect which you should see there, which I tried to explain, that is Chowershevsky theory. So as we saw before, this works uh, very well, and this gives uh, with a short amount of training time already on the test data, 97% uh, of uh, accuracy. Just one aspect, because it is important to mention it here and it fits as well to the theme. It's a recent paper. Um, I think I also quoted here. Yeah, here it is. I have two students in Zürich, uh, Jakob Heiss and Hannah Wutte. Funny is that uh, they are, uh, so they just started the PhD. I mean, Jakob really last week and Hannah a little bit longer, but uh, they produced, before they started the PhD, the first paper, which is <laughs> unusual, I <laughs> found. <laughs> but they, they wrote, uh, in their master thesis, they were taking up a thought line, namely this thought line of randomness, and they were proving uh, we uh, are going in a certain direction. Finally, we made up really proof of uh, this question, what is the role of randomness in 
simple shallow neural networks from dimension one to dimension one, where I choose the hidden layer, so the matrix, the first uh, uh, matrix um, um, random, and I only train the readout layer, and I make the number of nodes larger and larger, and I ask myself if I train shortly, as it happens in reality, so I make an early stopped gradient descent, I choose this random matrix uh, larger and larger going to more and more nodes, is there a limit for this? So is, for, is there an asymptotics if you have a large number of nodes and a randomly chosen input matrix, you only train the regression, but you train it very shortly. And the funny thing is, yes, there is a limit, and uh, this refers to a phenomenon which is called implicit regularization. The funny thing is, the limit is the spline interpolation of the, of the endpoints which you are given as training data. So it is somehow that you make two errors. You use a super highly overparameterized, randomly chosen family of functions, and you early stop an inverse problem calibration and you make that really ridiculously bad what you're doing in that sense that you have many, many nodes, a random matrix, and you just train your regression, but very shortly. And what comes out has a limit, and the limit is the spline interpolation of these endpoints which you're given. Spline interpolation means that the second derivative is controlled. Question. When you say limit shortly, you mean a, a small number of epoch? Uh, yes. Actually, you can hear the number of steps. You just say you have a fixed number of steps. And, but it somehow says that the randomness produces in this early stopped inverse problem uh, solution uh, an implicit regularization of the outcome. So it has a big advantage that you stop the calibration early because it means you do not find the global minimum. What would be the global minimum in a case where you have many nodes and only finitely many uh, training data? The global minimum is of course zero because if you have enough nodes, you can perfectly represent uh, L points. But you don't want to find this uh, global minimum because it is not interesting. If the training data are a little bit blurry, you would just fit such a thing through Important is that the regularization happens, which means you should early stop the calibration such that you nicely, smoothly go through the points. So this is also another aspect where you see the role of uh, 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 randomness nicely and where you can also prove this role of randomness in a nice way. In computer science, this phenomenon is called implicit regularization. Uh, some aspects are known, and I think uh, still I believe that this is a very maybe interesting uh, contribution to this uh, to this literature. There's another explanation of what randomness does in this uh, in this direction. Uh, sorry, that's something else. So we understand now this standard implementation with the couple of layers. We also understand how the training is done. It's a sort of early stopped uh, inverse problem uh, solution. We understand a little bit the role of randomness and uh, also what it can create. And I just wanted to show you also once again this uh, other interpretation with the dynamic systems from a coding point of view, as I said it before, so where you generate here on a, on a I think, uh, 400 dimensional input space, you have random vector fields, you have two controls, you have a discretization of 40, so this means you have a neural network of depth 40, and you can also try to uh, do the missed task with such a network, but now, as a difference, the uh, vector fields are just chosen randomly and you only change the control. So actually it's a very low amount of uh, parameters which you use here to fit it. And it still works. 
Um, I don't show it to you live because you see the difference to before is since this is a relatively deep network, the standard Keras implementation still calculates uh, through the whole gradient. This is an immense vector, and therefore it takes a little bit longer to do the training. It takes 230 seconds. It's also still a miracle for me how this machinery does it, because this is a super high dimensional optimization problem with a very complicated architecture, namely this uh, dynamical uh, uh, system architecture. And still it manages to do the training relatively well, and you achieve here an accuracy of uh, 90%. This is just uh, justifying the theorem from before. And to have a little bit of uh, empathy with the machine, I'm so sorry, I should have not done that. Yeah. Now I have to show you the training, because unfortunately I gave the model the same name, and I was initializing it before. Yeah, so I have to show you the training now. You will see how it uh, works, and then I can show you a little bit what the machine, which errors it makes. But then I talk about uh, some different aspects. So just that you see that it is a little bit slower, let us wait a second until the training starts. Yeah. So you see this is uh, slower, it goes slower through the pictures because each calculation of the gradient takes here a longer time and therefore um, uh, it takes a while until the training is done. But this is really the training of such a controlled, ordinary differential equation where you only uh, uh, choose the controls. And like uh, Charles Albert said before, you're choosing the directions in which you walk in order to get expressive for this missed uh, task. Yeah. This 600,000 uh, uh, parameters. What are the typical numbers for, uh, I would say, production systems? I mean, this is, uh, I would say, for a production system, even a low number. This goes in the millions. It depends on the tasks. Uh, for, 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 for instance, for GP Morgan uh, engine? We, should, we see examples afterwards. It depends uh, uh, on the uh, discretization, how many you have there, but there we use, what did we always use, uh, 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 layer, three or four hidden layers, and maybe one trading strategy at a certain point in time has then maybe 5,000 open parameters, you have 30 discretization points, where you can, but it can also be much larger, sometimes in image uh, uh, recognition it is much larger, and, uh, Google car can be much larger. Google yeah. cars. Yeah, yeah. But it is not always that the size is what matters. It somehow, as I tried to explain before, the num if you have a high number of parameters, you randomly initialize that, and the way how this randomness acts in the system, this is something important. So, I mean, if, uh, you don't have some asymptotics regarding the, this number. If, the, if this number goes large, does it mean the system is unstable? No. As we proved before, implicit regularization tells no, it is not unstable. Implicit regularization, because there the number goes to infinity. We take more and more nodes, this means okay. the random matrix gets larger and larger, the number of parameters is getting larger and larger and larger, and it is not unstable, the opposite. Yeah. It approximates something which is very nice to be approximate. Yeah, but how, how, how far does it depend on the, uh, I mean, how, can you, can, can you fake, can you uh, blur the system, I mean, uh, give an input, yeah. such as the, the, the input is really, is, uh, really near the, 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 the training set, but such that the result is really uh, bad. Um, 
the so you are referring yeah. you are referring to the robustness. Yeah, so you robust, have to, to finitely that. many points coming sampled from a function, and you want you ask if you sample a new point, do you really get uh, yes. good prediction of this uh, value? And uh, in my view, it is uh, often mm -hmm. like that that a larger number of parameters actually produces better generalization results. So it's rather the opposite of what one would think. Because large number of parameters in our old work means overfitting. overfitting. Mm -hmm. But since we do not calibrate up to the end, we calibrate only a little bit, it has not even time to run into this overfitting regime. And therefore, these two things play yes, against each other. We are relying somehow on, the, on this randomness. Yes. Just to, 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 to even though we to never say it. From the <laughs> <laughs> even though we never say it. So you see here, the task is done. And now I can do this. Uh, uh, we can look at the, how good this uh, dynamic system guy is uh, producing images of pictures. We can have a little bit of empathy. The guy makes mistakes, for instance, he thought this is a 6, even though it is a 4. 12% mistake rate, as predicted before. Here he thought it is an 8. No, it is a 3, even though it is an 8. You can understand a little bit where the error comes from. You can have a little bit of empathy with the machine. <laughs> but uh, these are mistakes sometimes we also do. But uh, otherwise, it is astonishing how well it works with a completely generic controlled ordinary differential equation to approximate a map from those pictures to their meaning. Yeah. So it is, this is this fascinating uh, role of randomness which we see here. Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, a little bit of introduction to the very basics of, uh, of uh, machine learning with a view towards uh, also modern research. Uh, now we come to uh, first implementation where we see this technology working in a context of uh, uh, financial industry and uh, what is the problem which we have been dealing with a couple of years ago in this work with Hans, Lucas and Ben so the, the problem is very simple the most uh, basic problem of finance or of economics you have a market environment in which you can invest the market environment is uh, a certain amount of uh, traded uh, instruments. In those instruments you can invest. The market environment usually comes with liquidity constraints and with transaction costs and uh, you cannot trade if the stock exchange is closed and all those things which are uh, determining a market environment. And you have uh, liabilities someone in the future depending on the market environment and you ask yourself with a certain view towards risk so as a risk measure how could you invest in this market such that the risk the downside risk is getting smaller how could you do that this is a question the standard question of finance and economics how do you invest such that the risk your exposure to uh, downside risk is actually getting uh, small. Recently we had a meeting with bankers in uh, ETH uh, about some uh, sponsoring and there it was very beautiful uh, that they, uh, so they are cooperating with us and we have a vehicle for these corporations which is called Risk Center. And those bankers said, look, we would like to work with you but Risk center is not a good name. We were very surprised <laughs> because in our academic uh, uh, language, risk is something which you always want to minimize. Risk is something which you want to get rid of and therefore you uh, 
we talk about risk as something dangerous, but they come from the from the investment side, those bankers. For them, risk is risk management, and the risk management unit is actually the unit they do not want to work for. These are the guys they make their life difficult, the regulators. They, and for them, risk is something super positive. This is what they want to exploit. It's not something which one has to minimize or which one talks negatively about. And they, yeah, right. So it was one of the recent uh, uh, encounters where I was reminded uh, again to the important uh, statement that so the risk has two signs. There's the positive risk and the negative risk. The positive risk is, of course, funny, makes your uh, pocket uh, full of money. The negative risk is this exposure, goes downwards. Here we talk about this risk, so we would like to risk reduce that. But we will also talk about the other one, uh, uh, searching for opportunities in the market environment. So this is the classical question of finance and economics. How did we treat or deal with this question classically? So when you look at... Uh, the work of uh, famous scholars like Nicole, what is the approach, how we deal with this, uh, with this work. We have a market environment, we choose a model which reflects as many properties of the market environment as you are able to include in the model, and then you use numerical technology, the best technology from numerical analysis in order to evaluate the model and to answer your question. Classical approach, this is the approach, I would say, even of modern science and technology. This is like uh, what did Isaac Newton, when he was asked how to calculate uh, planetary motions, how to predict planetary motions, he was uh, setting up a model. This was a differential equation model. The differential equation model describes well the data so far and is then used for prediction. So this is this classical approach of uh, science and technology. You write a model very often in form of a differential equation, and you solve the differential equation by uh, technology from numerical analysis, often with uh, nice convergence rates and bounds, and then you get answers to the question. What is the... So this was very successful, Black Scholes, Heston, all those models, stochastic optimization, they work with this principle. What is the disadvantage of this approach? What would you say? You are all experienced uh, 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 quants. What would you say is the disadvantage of this approach? It's, it's a local optimization. So The first thing is it's not so easy to find a model which really fits to the data. This is one thing, calibrate the model to the data. But there's a second aspect, which is also a real bottleneck. Can you take any model in the sense, uh, let's say you have S&P 500, so you have 500 assets. Can you just take a 500 dimensional stochastic differential equation, calibrate it to the data, and then solve it? The answer is no. The numerical analysis gives you a couple of heavy constraints, for instance, if you want to solve a stochastic optimization problem in dimension 500, your uh, computer will immediately tell you no. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't do that. Because there are dependencies on dimension, uh, NP-hard problems which show up from time to time. Uh, so the bottleneck is calibration solve the inverse problem which explains the data, and then numerical evaluation. And this problem with numerical evaluation gets even worse the more you want to be realistic. Yesterday we spoke shortly, Michelle, and we, uh, during this funny evening which we had yesterday, uh, take simply black shoulders and try to be realistic and add transaction costs to black shoulders. And then the first thing what you're doing when you want to solve, let's say, a portfolio selection or hedging problem in this setting, you have to read papers of 70, 80 pages length, which are only explaining that such a problem is well posed. Not talking about how to solve it. These are another uh, strand of literature. So, if you really want to have a realistic model, which includes liquidity constraints, transaction costs, uh, 
And if you want to reflect high dimensional market environment, the classical modeling approach is actually painful. You have to oversimplify, otherwise you will not reach it. And this is what is actually happening in financial industry. The reason is not that uh, bankers are not, uh, not uh, uh, good enough to do it, it's just a bottleneck from numerical analysis. You often have to reduce questions to a black shores setting without transaction cost because otherwise you're just unable to solve it. And uh, people try different technology there and have tried out different things. Uh, I'm always amazed when I go to financial industry how innovative the people are there in order to solve these complicated problems. They tried everything, but often it is not possible to get a solution only uh, beyond a, a, a simplified setting. Yeah. So this is the classical modeling approach, beauty and tragedy of it. We have the beauty in the sense that it is a very general approach which gave us a lot of uh, uh, insights as on financial markets and since Black Shows financial markets have changed uh, uh, tremendously but the tragedy is you are really constrained to tractability and tractability is a strong issue yeah. you will see that in this machine learning environment this is completely different this is really not uh, a problem anymore. This is the first thing which I was very surprised to understand. When you do a machine learning implementation of such a hedging problem, of such a risk management problem, you have actually no problem at all to add any sort of market friction, liquidity constraint, that you can only trade after the coffee break, all those things you can precisely say, my trading happens then, and then I want to have the optimal decision, which includes this and that information. My trade is only going with integer numbers because I cannot, arrive, I cannot buy one divided by the square root of two number of shares. I can buy one or zero. All those things you implement immediately, and it is just without any pain. This is one first thing which one should appreciate with this approach. It is extremely easy to include market friction. So it's just an additional line of code which you uh, put there. So let me first explain you a little bit how such an implementation looks like in an environment where you feel comfortable. This is a Black Shores setting here, so we know how the solution looks like, and we will see a little bit how the solution also compares to the Black Shores solution. So let me look at that. Uh, uh, problem now a little bit in uh, detail here. So we are here in a, in a Black Shores environment. We have a market which is uh, growing. We are happy with that. Investment makes sense, but of course this is not a necessary assumption. We can also have it differently. There is, uh, due to nice duality theory, uh, the absence of arbitrage can be seen easily because there is an equivalent measure making this model uh, martingale. This corresponds, of course, to uh, discounted uh, prices. We have one vehicle, one trading instrument in which we can invest. And we are considering here liabilities in the future which just depend on the stock price at time t. And the most important one, which we consider, will be a plain vanilla European core. So this is then the hockey stick function, depending on. That. Yeah. And for this, of course, the Black Scholes theory, as it was formulated many years ago, just tells if you want to calculate, uh, let's say, you measure risk with uh, with L2 criterion, and you would like to find. Uh, uh, an investment in the market which gets as close as possible to this uh, liability in the future, you have a certain price and you have a certain trading strategy. You can calculate the trading strategy by those deltas. You can calculate the price by the expectation with respect to the martingale measure. And this gives you actually, in this case, a perfect replication of this future liability by portfolio. 
and the interpretations in Black Scholes is like that. If you sell this liability to a customer, so this means the liability is in your books, you charge the customer the expectation, and then you build the portfolio which hatches your risk in the books completely. Yeah. So this is classical Black Scholes theory, a beauty, uh, beautiful application also of uh, stochastic analysis. And it's a solution, in this case, of a convex optimization problem. Namely, you want to get in L2 as close as possible to the uh, liability which you have in the future by a trading strategy H. I use here, by the way, the, the Meyer notation, so I don't write stochastic integrals with an integral, I write them with a dot, and with a price pi. And there's a unique solution for both, and this is actually precisely the delta hedging. Yeah? So, how comes machine learning into that picture? How do I translate this into a machine learning problem? How do I do that? Now, yeah, the answer is actually relatively simple. You just say you use a universally approximating function family in order to represent your trading strategies. So this means you say the trading strategy at each point in time tells you how many stocks you hold. And you can imagine, and in this case you can also prove it, the trading strategy will depend on time and on the price. So you take a neural network with two inputs, time and the price, and you say the output should be the number of shares. And then you choose a neural network that says a certain architecture, in this case a very simple feed-forward architecture, three layers. And then you just train this neural network. And the price, you could also say the price should depend on, uh, so also write it as a neural network, depending on, uh, on, those, uh, on those structures. Um, expectation, you have an expectation here. Um, what are the training data here? So how do you make that, what are you training on? You could say, well, uh, I <coughs> discretize the expectation, I take a Monte Carlo estimate of the expectation, so I choose uh, a number of scenarios from my Black-Scholes model, let's say two million scenarios. You write the expectation as the estimator, Monte Carlo estimator, over these two million scenarios, and then it looks very much like a classical machine learning problem, you have the scenarios omega i, these are actually the, the xi's, training data arguments, and you have a loss function, the loss function is the, the square liability minus uh, the networks representing the hedge minus this network representing the price, and then you sum it up. Pi is uh, the cost of the friction. The no, pi is in this case just the price, just the premium. Trend. It's we have no friction phase, just for simplicity, just to explain what they do. And then you uh, interpret the omega i as the training data x i, the arguments of the training data. We don't have y i's, we just have a, a, a loss function, because when you think about the how Training works, actually it is not always the case that you have to learn in a supervised way how to transport from xi to yi, actually you can also just optimize a loss function. And this is what we have here, we have a loss function, it looks like that, we have omega i's, and the pi i's and the h i's are just neural networks which I would like to choose such that this loss gets as small as possible. Yeah? That's all. market you can take any probability the historical probability works but uh, if not it's maybe more uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, risk more measures uh, you would do it differently but in this case it is as okay to take just the uh, the um, historical measure yeah huh? 
So, so just to be back to the pi, what why is the pi in the, in the infinite numbers? Is it dependent on the, the strategy, the pi? Is it dependent on h? No. Uh, so it, it could be I do the simplest infinity. implementation here, which you can imagine. I just want to learn the h, and somebody gives me the pi. So I don't even learn the pi in the implementation here. Therefore, it is not in the infinite. Okay, so otherwise, you would put it. Yeah. But otherwise, you would also put it in the infinite mode when you take the general implementation, which we were uh, doing in, uh, in London, and where you also have the code available. Uh, everything is learned, of course. But just for the this is for 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 uh, uh, showing you how such an implementation. So therefore, for this example, is not relevant. The pi is. So let me show you a little bit how that looks. So we initialize it, get all our packages which we need here. This is producing me my market environment. In this case, the market environment is very simple. This is a Black Shores market with a certain drift and a certain volatility. And I have a discretization here of 20 uh, uh, discretization points. As you, you can think 20 weeks in the future, you have your liability and you hedge weekly. Yeah. But of course, you can do that differently. And these are just examples how these uh, trajectories look like. I think I have here volatility of 20%. Uh, yeah, I took maturity equal to 1. So it is, uh, if you were thinking in years, it is, let's say, approximately every second week you are hatching. And one year. This is the calculation of the Black Shores price. The Black Shores price in this setting would be 7.9 cent of a European option at the money starting at for a price which starts at 1. So you start the price at 1, you have 20% of uh, volatility, one year of maturity, you start at the money and the Black Shores formula gives you then a, a, a price of 7 cent. And now we do the machine learning implementation of that guy. So we just uh, uh, take this funny use of Keras, which I already told you before. I make this list of layers where I do not say what the input dimension is. I just abstractly use, as if I were a mathematician thinking about uh, it, I, choose a, I make a list. This is a finite sequence of layers, which are abstract objects with a non-linearity, the non-linearity is the ReLU, so this is the hockey stick function, and with uh, certain randomly chosen initial values, this is all normally chosen here, I even give a name to each layer, and this is producing me, as I was saying it before, the vector fields, these random vector fields here. Difference is, I click this train everything, so I do not work with uh, Fixed vector fields and training And these layers are used in order to build now my strategy. So how is that working? What is the input here? The input is uh, price, so the market price at time t, at time zero at the beginning, and also uh, hatch, you will see why this is like that. So here, what we first do is we build the hatching strategy at time j. j is run from uh, 0 to n minus 1. This is the hatching point in time. And here, the strategy takes as an input the price. Then you apply a couple of layers to it. So you build the, the deep network, take input the price, build the network, with a couple of layers, the number of layers is equal to d here, and then you have it, and this is the strategy at time j. Okay. 
Now something uh, additionally happens, and this is a little bit this uh, funny way of using Keras. So I create actually now a new input. Yeah. Here this is the input which I had at the beginning, then I take a new one. Yeah. I will add it then later, you will see at the end, the inputs are fixed here, but I add this additional input which I create in the loop to the list of inputs. So my, the number of inputs actually grows uh, dynamically here. Yeah, and what do I do with it? Uh, the input is just a market increment. This is, come, this is arriving at time j. You don't know what is happening in the future, but if you get it, this is the next increment of the market. You use it, you build your price, you get the, the price increment, and you can calculate the new price, and uh, you can calculate the hedge, and you can calculate the wealth of the hedge by just uh, uh, adding the price increment multiplied with the strategy evaluated at the price at time j. The price increment goes from j to j plus 1. You take this together and you add it to your hedge which you had so far, and this then gives you the uh, wealth of your hedging portfolio. And at the end, when you have gone through this loop, what did you do? You start with the price as zero. You have a trading strategy at time zero. This is a neural network of a certain depth. This depends on uh, S0 and uh, it gives you a value. It tells you this number of stocks you actually buy. Then the next increment arrives. This you consider as an input of the whole model because it will be used then for the next strategy, but you consider it formally as an input of the model. And then you say calculate the new price, multiply the trading strategy with the increment of the market, and update your wealth process by this increment times hatching strategy by this uh, uh, cumulative gains and loss over one period. So you run through this whole guy, at the end you have the value of the hatching portfolio, you subtract the value of the hatching portfolio from the payoff, this is just the liability minus the hatching portfolio, and this gives you then the loss function. So at the end, what happens is you have created the neural network model in a little bit funny way by not specifying at the beginning the inputs but updating the inputs through the whole loop. Inputs are price at time zero, price increments up to the end, and the output is payoff, liability, minus the value of the hedging portfolio. And well, this is the model, and this is coming with a couple of parameters. It is from a, from a point of view of uh, how you write models in Keras, a little bit funny way to, to set up a model like that, but it works and it produces uh, precisely what you would like to implement if you are thinking as a, as a trader. And now you can... Initialize this model. Look for the number of trainable parameters. It's not so many here. Not so many trainable parameters, only 2,000, because the network is not very deep. And we have 20 points where you uh, have such networks, and they have a couple of uh, uh, low hundreds of uh, parameters uh, there. You take here as a ridiculously low amount of training data. I don't take 2 million of scenarios, I just take 20,000 scenarios. So I train on 20,000 uh, Black Shores uh, um, crisis path. And remember what was the input? The input was price, then the Starting value of your hedging portfolio, this is zero, and the 
uh, increments of the market. And the training data are 20,000 market increments. This is, in the case of Black Shores, just uh, the log uh, increment. So we have that. Then you say, OK, it's mean squared error. This is what we're interested in, because we are looking at this L2 problem. We take an optimizer. I said before, the stochastic gradient descent, actually, one always uses a slightly improved version of stochastic gradient descent, which is called ADAM. So this is an adapted version of stochastic gradient descent, where you have a little bit, you don't fully believe in the gradient. You additionally also say where I am is maybe not so bad. So it's a moment um, modified uh, classical gradient descent. But as to say, it works very well, but still this is, from a point of view of inverse problem, not a very advanced technology. So there is no regularization, no whatever, Lasso, Tikhonov, nothing. Very simple implementation, because actually we don't want to find the global minimum. We are interested in an early stopped thing. Yeah. And now you can just... Uh, Make the training. So this you have to imagine really as if you have a trainee in your bank, a trainee in your bank who does not know anything about trading, because this artificial trader starts tabula rasa, this in machine learning. This means random initialization, the trade is done in a way which is completely innocent about the market situation. The trader does not know. The only thing the trader knows is after uh, going along a trajectory a couple of times, he or she sees was it successful or not what I did. And at the beginning, of course, it was not successful because it was completely independent of the whole surroundings. But the only thing the trader she can do is to say, OK, I failed last time. I do it a little bit better this time. Yeah by adapting the parameters such that your loss gets smaller. And this is done all the time, again and again and again. Like a trainee in your bank whom you let trade in one and the same market environment again and again and again until she finds a good way how to hedge. Say that. You would be bankrupt before. You would be bankrupt before, but actually, how was the how was the experience built of the traders at the Chicago uh, Stock Exchange in the in the 60s? They were just relying on experience they made and others made by doing it again and again and again and improving uh, uh, their knowledge. This is actually what is happening here. This is how you should see it. You have an artificial trader. She's playing again and again and again in the same market environment and improving herself all the time because she knows last time I failed, this time I fail a little bit less, and so on and so on and so on. We so agree with you, but we have, you have the implied hypothesis that the past will explain the future. I agree with that. Of course. Of, of course. Because the a stochastic professor will not accept me. No, 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 no. If he believes in a risk and a probability, but that's not. I think because when you say that model where successful uh, when you calibrate a model at time t, you, yeah. you are supposed, if you believe in the risk neutral probability, uh, to have your, the parameters of your model. And in that case, you have to believe that past will be yeah, yeah, yeah. the future. I mean, there are a couple of assumptions here. Namely, the assumption here is that you believe in the scenarios. Mm -hmm. and the scenarios encode the model which you have uh, behind. But I do not use any sort of analysis in the model. I just learn by those scenarios how the optimal solution would look like. In France, in financial product, product it's written that uh, past performances, performances do not explain the future. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> mandatory. <laughs> yes. But we will also say <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Even past, past, is past observation is yeah. just Monte Carlo It's generation. just Monte Carlo generation. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Have the only one belief is is Black Shores yeah. model. You yeah. believe that this market environment is given by, by, by Black Shores. For yeah. example, it's Monte Carlo, but in, in real life uh, it would be some uh, back testing. No? Yeah. In real life it, would be, it is done like that. You, 
as a beauty of this approach here, you have a time series which you observe. Let's say you have uh, uh, one stock, the Google stock, you observe it for two years, you have this time series, then you take your most favorite econometric model and you estimate it. Mm -hmm. And then you generate by this model okay. mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. Then you come and say, Joseph, this is one model, there's another one. This is also very good. Then I say, okay, let's add those scenarios. And let's add them with a Bayesian approach. So 40% are from my model, 60% from yours, because I also believe that you are more intense. So but you cheat <laughs> models for training. Yes. But did you try to train it only with market data, no model at all? Um, in this case, it would not work, because market data gives you one trajectory from the past. Mm -hmm. And you need a certain amount of trajectories in yeah. order to... You add them. But this is the method that you generate in one or the other way out of past data scenarios. So the... the, the, the you know that uh, people try by other methods. They, uh, for example, they take the last 10, uh, 10 data, the last 10 uh, data from the past 10 days, and then they try to predict the next one. And they Absolutely. go on like that with a recurrent network. Yes. Have you, have you compared? We, uh, you, uh, I mean, this is a different question than that one. Thing. This is not a prediction question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is a question of risk uh, management. Uh, in the afternoon, I will speak about precisely such a question: recurrent yeah. networks and making predictions. Yeah. And uh, we also have a, maybe a slightly different take on that. Yeah. But of course, this works very well. Yeah. In that case, our idea is that if we are in a an inefficient market, a yeah. market which is not perfect, pure, yeah. perfect, as I would say, it could be useful for us to make a compare between the theoretical model risk neutral, which could not apply, yeah. because there is a theoretical problem to apply it, where yeah. it's a legal political market, for instance, yeah. and to compare with the historical data, it means that we are okay to use it as if the model is not efficient. Efficient, the market is not efficient. Yeah. And we want to make a compare between the, the real facts and what the theoretical model said about the edge, about the. Absolutely. The you can, all sorts of studies which you always wanted to make, you can make in that environment. Yeah. You have the possibility, let's say, to, uh, to train uh, in, a, in, a, in a market environment which you can define traders and look what happens in those games. And of course, this is an optimization problem. You can make games out of the yeah, different yeah. agents with different uh, preferences and so on and so on. You have many options to do. It's just a very simple uh, implementation of it. And you see, already after a very short amount of time, this is not a great hedge, but at least it concentrates around zero. Uh, it is, uh, when you look at uh, at the loss, the loss is already in the order 10 to the power minus 5. Not super great, but already good. Mm. Yeah. Very short amount of time, your artificial trader actually achieved a relatively robust, uh, uh, robust result. Yeah. So this is um, the... A first uh, view towards uh, a first view towards uh, applications in financial industry of machine learning by just creating artificial traders and artificial intelligence for traders, which you train then and which does for you certain tasks by getting uh, uh, better and better along predefined uh, scenarios. Just that you get a good feeling for what is happening here, I was preparing something uh, relatively simple just from the implementation point of view that you see a little bit uh, uh, how this uh, Keras implementation works and this is what I want to show you uh, before lunch that you will maybe feel so comfortable after this little uh, example here that you can code actually the things yourself. So what I do here, this is just demonstration, demonstrating in a very simple context how the code is written. So I take 
actually structure wise the same code as for deep patching, but now I have an extremely simple input. The input is one dimensional and it is a real number, and the output is also one dimensional and it is the square of the number. So actually, I want to learn a parabola. Just that you see it once, and you see it as precisely in the framework which I had before. So I import all those, uh, those uh, packages which I need in order to do the task. I take this list of layers, this abstract list of layers, and then I do precisely the same as before. I have a price input shape, but now everything is, so I do not go uh, to a large n, I just have a thing n equal to zero. So actually I only calculate once I build this, uh, I take these layers and concatenate them in order to get a network of a certain depth. Code looks precisely the same and gives me then just, as you see it here, a neural network with a one dimensional input. Then I have a dense layer going to dimension 32. Then I have a dense layer going from 32 to 32 and then I go from 32 to 1. So this is how one strategy is built with precisely the same uh, thing as before. Who can explain the 64 and the 1056? Why 64? Not from a one-dimensional space to a 32-dimensional space, an affine map comes with a 1 times 32 matrix plus a vector. Right, 64. And here we go from 32 to 32, so this is 32 times 32 plus 32. This is this number, and then we go from 32 to 1. This is 32 plus 1, because the bias is one dimension. So this is this uh, uh, neural network of uh, depth uh, 2, right? Number of trainable parameters is 1,153. Then I take 20,000 uh, training data as before. Before I had 20,000 scenarios, now it's just 20,000 randomly chosen points. And the loss function is here very simple. It is the target is a square. And I just want to train my network that it explains well those uh, points. Yeah, as so precisely what is done before. Of course, here the training goes very quickly. You should not forget this is an optimization in a 1530 dimensional space which is running here. But it works. I suppose you know the papers of Zahosky? Yeah. Zahosky, because this is his problem. Yeah. And now you see what it does. Actually, uh, these are testing data which are larger, so you go further out. You see on the training data, actually, the network is very, very good. Outside it fails. Uh, you cannot expect that it is outside good if you are far away, but when you look a little bit in the uh, where the training data get already a little bit uh, sparse, you do not have many training data here, still it is relatively good and then at a certain point it uh, uh, deteriorates. This is just to explain you in a setting which is uh, very uh, simple to understand how the training of a neural network works, how this uh, um, way of using uh, Keras works where you first abstractly define lists of layers and then you concatenate those lists of layers in order to uh, produce uh, a deep network which is in this case the strategy and yeah if you want to have more inputs you could as I said before within the loop add additional inputs and then at the end always extend that list. So these are ways how to deal with that and it's actually relatively easy to understand how one builds these neural networks which then do this, uh, this task. Yeah. So this should take you a little bit the fear of 
this piece of code here where you make the list of uh, layers and then actually the building up of the whole model where the hatching strategy value and the future prices are calculated uh, within this loop. You always think about this parabola fitting and you understand precisely where this is happening. Uh, one aspect which I tell you right before lunch, it should also give you a good feeling. Uh, you would say this is actually relatively short code for such a complicated task. I mean, we build up a thousand parameters thing of, uh, of uh, parameterized family. We are able to calibrate it to the data. So this means we are solving an optimization problem. It is very easy to write down the, to build these families of functions. So actually, it looks really very accessible what is happening here. This was not always like that, and I show you only that you see it once. And uh, for uh, for your convenience, how this looked when we did it first time. So this is the actually to be precise. This is the second version of the deep hatching code as we did it in. Uh, as we did it in uh, at JP Morgan. So we were not using Keras at this time. We were following an advice of uh, several people telling, actually, if you want to really do it, you do it with TensorFlow. TensorFlow is what is behind Keras. This is the, the language in which these optimization problems are nicely coded by Google. It has been developed by Google. And there, you see that actually it is not a very easy problem and you see it also when you look at the length of the code. So this is precisely the same task in the Black Shores market uh, than the story. There is not more in there. But you see, this is complicated code. So one also has to uh, appreciate the technology of the computer language, the good notation, as we would say in mathematics, it is really extremely accessible with these new languages which we have available, which allow us to set up easily neural networks, to train them easily, and to avoid writing code where you actually need to be a specialist in order to read it. One should also appreciate that and this is recent, this is not that we have said since long time. So 20 years ago, the piece of code in order to train it would have been very, very long, because you would have also needed to write this optimization procedure on these hundreds of thousand dimensional spaces. I mean, these are all complicated things. TensorFlow was already a very big progress in order to achieve that, but Keras as a way how to address TensorFlow in such a short way is again a big progress in making prototyping such things easy, really easy. So imagine two years ago when I gave this course, I always go, went through the TensorFlow code and this, only this code took a day just to explain a little bit what is going on there because it's not a trivial language. And this also uh, makes a difference that we have now such accessible languages which allow to define the whole model in this little bit of code which you can almost read like English. Mm. You start with the price, you put a layer on it, and another layer on it, and another layer on it, then the increment comes which you read it like English. If you are a little bit accustomed, it is a novel. And this is also one of the advantages of this language that it is so Optimal. I will soften your statement. You need to be good in NumPy. Yes. And NumPy, not everybody knows NumPy. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. a linear algebra. A linear algebra of, uh, uh, implementation in, uh, in Python. Python. There, one has to be able to play a little bit with those things. But I'm really a novice in that. Some people are much more experienced in that. And already, if you know a little bit basic structures, you can, you can deal with those things. Yeah. 
So this should make you appreciate also that um, even though we do relatively complicated tasks here, it is very easy to code them and also to let them run. You neither need computer clusters for it, nor do you need to uh, be a specialist in uh, high-level computer language in order to, uh, to code those things. Uh, it's accessibility of technology, which is also an aspect in my view here. Yeah, and then you can do uh, this training. Let me just show it to you uh, again that you appreciate a little bit how nicely in this Black Shores market strategies are actually happening. So here you see losses getting smaller and smaller. And you see the histogram of profit and loss getting more and more narrow. I was of course taking only a small amount of, uh, of uh, um, Training scenarios, in reality, you take more, but it uh, uh, works really surprisingly well how quickly you find the uh, Black Shores uh, strategy. This is a little bit at the beginning, so there is not much training happening. It's not the evaluation of the training before. This would be the real Black Shores strategy, mm -hmm. and this is what it finds after a little bit of time, the blue one. But only a little bit, just to see, because it starts really somewhere. It starts with something which is completely independent of the market environment. So, so, far, so far, there is no transaction cost. So far, no. But how would you add transaction cost? Very simple. You just write in your model at each time when you make a trade, you say, OK, and this trade costs something, period. You have one line of code longer, and the training Precisely the same time, just the same thing. So in that sense, it is really very, very uh, accessible and it's easy to implement. It. And if you have trading constraints, if you say you have, do not have the right to go short, you cannot buy more than two of the shares, you just write it there. That's it. Yeah. Does it way to, on the theoretical basis to test the so-called uh, efficiency hypothesis uh, of the standard finance theory? Because the structure of, the, of what you find is not near what the model says. Does it a way to prove that the market is not efficient? Mm, no, but this is, uh, this is just for illustration. This is after yeah. a very short amount of training. This is okay. like you have a trainee in your bank whom you let play in your market environment, <coughs> he did not uh, play And you wrong. expect that the two curve uh, with a lot of data will... Uh, they are spot on. It finds it. it. Okay. Yeah, they are spot on. But it takes a little bit of time. For with training. time and the data, we will spot the two figures. Right? Yes, absolutely. Very big of that. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's amazing how it does it. Mm. Okay. Okay. Dear friends, I think I was uh, <coughs> enough uh, material transporting from here to here. Uh, are there questions? Take the neural network with parameter tetras, insert the xi, subtract yi, take it to the square, and sum it up of our training data. This is the loss function, mean squared error. And how is the algorithm working? The algorithm gradient descent would be nothing else than solving a certain ordinary differential equation, the ordinary differential equation 
is nothing else than the gradient flow of this loss function. You do what you do when you are going down from a mountain, you follow the steepest descent of direction, which is the direction minus the gradient of the loss function. This is of course discretized, and the discretization is then theta t plus 1 is theta t plus the learning rate. In machine learning, the discretization, the time discretization is called learning rate. Take the learning rate times uh, the gradient of the loss function. And sorry, I made a mistake here. It should be a minus. So this is just the uh, uh, gradient descent algorithm. What is stochastic gradient descent? Just to explain it once for the people who did not see that so far. Stochastic gradient descent does nothing else than saying I can write this sum actually as a double sum by taking so-called mini-batches. So this is a sum over a sub-part of this sum and then summing over all possible mini batches so let's say these are 1,000 points. You slice these 1,000 points in 100 batches of size 10. And then you sum over all batches. And each, in each batch, you sum over the uh, mini batch. So you have a double sum then here. And then the gradient is not calculated with the whole sum. The gradient is calculated with the mini batch. In comparison to the correct gradient, this is a sort of blurry version of the gradient. This is the gradient plus a little bit of noise, and the noise is generated actually by using the data itself. This is the simple-minded uh, uh, technology which is used here, and somehow under quotation marks, one solves this type of problem. One tries to calculate where the loss function finds an infimum. And as I tried to advocate in the morning, actually, uh, when you look at it like that, you would say this is, you make two things very wrong here. The first thing is you use a highly overparameterized family of functions in order to solve a possibly not so complicated training task by a family of functions which has far too many parameters. The combination of these two actually wrongly applied techniques yield something relatively good. Not only relatively good, amazingly good. And uh, I try to give several kinds of arguments for that. There's this implicit regularization, which you see, early stopped gradient descent, plus a highly randomly overparameterized family of function actually gives a spline approximation through the data. There is randomness itself as a phenomenon produces uh, networks where you only have to train the last layer, the readout layer, and then it is a regression function, produces networks which are expressive. So you can see it like that, that the randomness, the random vector fields which I was using, they are just producing functions which are so rich that you can approximate many uh, nonlinear functions by them. So randomness creates good regression based. This, this is the, the uh, philosophy. <coughs> and one should not forget, this is the basic structure. This structure comes into or becomes really a fascinating technology since there are languages, programming languages, and packages which are so accessible to the public, to young students, to uh, researchers like me, that one can make this program implemented actually very easily. This is also a feature of this whole technology that it is so accessible. So 20 years ago, you would have paid a lot of money for licenses to get from MATLAB the best uh, optimizer to solve a certain optimization problem. Here we have the best optimizer which is available. This is done by Google, we have been working six years on to get that really best uh, technology and it is uh, a free way. 
So one should also see that it is, on the one hand, a fascinating optimization problem or a fascinating nonlinear regression problem, and on the other hand, technology available which allows to see uh, the result uh, very quickly and actually for everybody. Are there questions for this basic structure? From your side. Please. Do you knew the speed of uh, taking the gradient? Yeah, the gamma. The gamma. Yeah. So it's a thing that can change? How do you Usually, in a standard implementation, it starts at the value, I think, which is very often 0.01, and then it gets smaller and smaller over time, but with a very small rate. Of course, you can adapt that. And you should also adapt it. It just means that. In training, you start first with a relatively large time discretization. Gamma corresponds to the delta t in our ODE, and then you make it smaller and smaller in order not to overshoot for the local minimum which you find. But these are, yeah, this is part of this. Uh, when you take the optimizer, you can have add a lot, couple of parameters there, which says take gradient descent. Take a stochastic gradient descent, how big is the mini batch, and just for the languages, so what is an epoch when you want, once went through all mini batches? So you have your 1000 training data, you slice it into 100 pieces of 10, then you calculate for the 10 the gradient, and then you make, take the next 10, the next 10, when you have these guys through once, then an epoch is finished. So this is just the language which you always uh, uh, see here. Then you remember we had this very simple example. There were a couple of questions I was asked as well, uh, during lunch break. So let me just uh, uh, say some things again here. So this is just in order to demonstrate that there is a relatively nice and abstract way first to create a list. So this is just a finite sequence of layers, which you then later use in order to build up a, a, a network architecture. So you can take these layers abstractly and then you plug them together as you like. Yeah? I just wanted to demonstrate that there is no particular deeper meaning of that. And in particular, does the word in Christ and strategy only refer to the other code, but has not a meaning here? You could also say this is just the input, and this is then the output, as it is also written here. But the price has no particular meaning, as not a word strategy. It is just demonstrated, we have here a one-dimensional input, m will be one, then later on, and then you build a mirror network of depths. Uh, three, three hidden layers, and you just take input, apply a layer on it, apply a layer on it, apply a layer on it, finish. That's what happens. Yeah. And then, as I showed before, this very simple training task is done. There you can check whether you fully understood how the parameters are calculated. As we said before, this is an affine map from R1 to R32. This is 64 parameter. This is an affine map from 32 dimensional space to 32 dimensional space. This has 1056 parameters. And then you go from 32 dimensional space to 1 dimensional space. This has 33 parameters. And all those parameters are trained in this example. So it's a still the calculation of. Uh, a gradient in dimension 1,153. One has to appreciate this is what happens in the background. And the model is compiled, and here the training runs. And you see this is an epoch which is happening here. It once goes through the uh, uh, to the, the 20,000 patches. What is the batch size which I was choosing here? The batch size is here extreme, it's one. So I slice the 20,000 points into 20,000 batches. This means my gradient is relatively blurry. Mm -hmm. And then I go through it once. But it goes very quickly because it is so well uh, implemented. And then you see on the, I take the training data, let's say now with, uh, uh, with one, you see on the, on the 
Similar set of data, it is actually a very nicely approximated uh, parabola. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they take the training data a little bit larger, you see what is in machine learning called, uh, the, the testing data a little bit uh, further out in space, what is in machine learning called generalization. So the ability to extrapolate beyond the training data is of course deteriorating if you are far away. Mm. Yeah. And it can also only be like that. The network never saw any point here, and therefore it should not know what is here. If it knows, <coughs> you did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not magic what is happening here. It is just uh, nonlinear uh, regression, which on a certain training set is good. And if you are far away from the training set, it is, of course, independent of the problem. The fascinating thing is that it gets relatively quickly, so we are talking here about the training which takes a second. We make a second of training in a 1,500 dimensional space and we reach relatively quickly a uh, good result. This is fascinating. And also what I tried to say uh, before, you see, um, the the, the, the function which comes out here has nice second derivatives. So it is relatively smoothly going through the point. Even if you were taking a blurry version of the parabola, so that you are around the parabola, it would still be that, the solution. So it's a spline interpolation. This is also a beauty of that, that even though you never talked about splines when you were setting up the optimization problem, what happens in reality is the spline interpolation. It's as a beauty, you have one sort of problem which is super easy to implement, but you solve actually a much more complicated problem. That's a funny aspect of this. Uh, thing. Okay, so in the next uh, hour, or maybe one and a half hour, I want to give you a little bit of an overview which types of problem we have been uh, dealing with in um, machine learning in finance and uh, I also invite you to take a little bit look at the code enjoy yourself by being able to train networks you should just do it once it will give you a very good feeling after this day that you are actually able to train a network uh, just like uh, all these uh, 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 fancy people you read about in the newspapers, you can do that yourself and you can do it for a task you define yourself, be it a nonlinear approximation task, be it a portfolio optimization, be it a hedging task. Uh, so I want to go a little bit through and here you have different code pieces in form of IPython notebooks where uh, some problems are solved. So which problems did we so far consider in our uh, working group? So it started, as I said, uh, with this work with J.P. Morgan, deep hedging. Actually, this is not completely true. It started a tiny little bit earlier, but it was not a deep hedging work. It was a so-called uh, deep calibration work, where it started, and this was done in South Africa. So I spent together with Krista, um, my colleague, with whom we are publishing also a lot, I spent uh, uh, several weeks in summer 2017 in, in South Africa in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town and I was taking part at the, uh, an event which is called the Financial Mathematics Team Challenge. Did anybody hear about that? Team Challenge. It is organized by University of Cape Town. David Taylor is the mastermind uh, there. And what they are doing is they invite people from, uh, for instance, Zurich or Vienna to supervise for 10 days something which has the level of a master thesis but is written by four people within 10 days, 10 days of intensive work. So this is, why is it called the team challenge? Because the problems are given in a slightly formalized way and at the end of the team challenge the best thing wins a uh, prize. So we gave to our group of four people, we gave a calibration problem 
uh, to them it was actually a relatively complicated calibration problem, so it, is, uh, it was uh, uh, high-white extended Vasicek model in interest rate theory. So the high-white extension is of course a curve, and the curve is in principle infinite dimensional object. And we wanted to calibrate this high-white extended Vasicek model to a market given by an interest rate curve and by Ekeman swap chain prices. So nonlinear derivatives and the interest rate curve. And there were, I think, the interest rate curve was given by 44 evaluations of the curve up to 30 years. And I think there were 156 uh, at the money option prices. So it's a 200 dimensional data vector, and you want to choose uh, the Vasicek model such that it explains those data. A very standard thing, and uh, usually any quant here, each of you says, uh, does such a thing in the morning between 8 and 8.5. You just open Quantlib take the corresponding guy there, insert the data, get the parameters of the model. This is what uh, usually happens. You have to wait a little bit because the optimizer in quantum takes a little bit of time. So the question was, can you machine learn this map? Can you take this map uh, from the data to the model parameters and actually learn it? Can you train a network which precisely produces this map? Yeah. This is what we gave to the students, and uh, this work was also not, um, we were not the first ones considering it. The seminal work in this area comes uh, from uh, Quant in Frankfurt now. Andres Hernandez, he wrote a paper on that, actually claiming that this works very well, and it asked, we asked the students, can we make that higher dimensional? So does it depend on the the dimensionality of the problem first, and can we improve it? Because the results of Andres Hernandez were good, but one had the impression maybe it can get even a little bit better. So these were the two questions. And then in the 10 days, uh, the students were, of course, a little bit overwhelmed by this problem, but finally came up uh, with uh, uh, beautiful solutions. Why were they overwhelmed? Because at this time you always use TensorFlow code, and TensorFlow code, which was provided by Andres Hernandez, this is really a long piece of code. So there, it's not like this Keras things. It is really a very long piece of code, and it took Christian and me also a week only to get an idea what is happening with this complicated thing and how to modify it in order to get a more complicated thing. But what finally came out at the end of this. Uh, uh, team challenge was actually this calibration problem can be learned. So what are the training data here? The training data are uh, many instances where you actually uh, solve by quantlib this problem. So you take the data from the market, you get quantlib parameter. Market, another market, at another day quantlib parameters. Another day quantlib parameters. You get the historical series for certain parameters, uh, certain market data, you get the parameters. And then you take those, uh, I think we had 1,000 data points. This is a data cloud. And you need to extend this uh, data cloud a little bit in order to have a sufficient amount of data available. So we did not calculate. Uh, uh, with Quantlib, I don't know, 150,000 times. We calculated this like, about 1,000 times, and then we made a, um, an extrapolation technique how to create actually 150,000 training data point out of those 1,000 points. You can imagine it a little bit like that, a sort of uh, uh, take parameters which you get, perturb them a little bit, calculate the prices, and then invert the arrow, and then you have a new data point. This is what we did. OK, then we took this 150,000 uh, training data points, and we took a network, I think, of depths five, six, many hundred parameters. We let it train, relatively long in that case. But finally, what comes up is an extremely good uh, solver of a calibration problem. So when you come now with a new set of uh, 
market data, you just insert it into the network, it immediately, immediately gives you parameters of the model and you can then uh, sort of compare what would quantly give, give and you see that it works extremely well to learn that. So this was the first uh, fascinating thing. It was just model selection done by neural networks. Why is this a nice problem also to, uh, to do the, or to start with? You can see it a little bit like that. If you allow me to draw that there so. And I think you are possibly doing also some problems of that type here at the uh, Matixis. So a model in the language of finance usually comes with a vector of parameters. Let's call this vector of parameters lambda. Might be low, but also high dimensional. And Usually it is possible, not always G, but possible to calculate for a given vector of parameters prices you are interested in. You just, if it is Black-Scholes, you take either the Black-Scholes formula or you take a Monte Carlo uh, uh, engine and you can calculate all possible prices. Yeah? You can generate usually easily a large training set here because this can be parallelized very easily. So you can get for a large set of input vectors here, prices here. Yeah? And the question what I said before, what did we use as training data set? Now, yeah, actually, we just wanted to learn the inverse of this map. So of course, if you can generate lambdas and prices corresponding to lambda, you can also generate prices corresponding to lambdas and lambdas. This is just uh, interchanging the order of uh, uh, how you write it down. And the question was, can you find a neural network which learns this map? Easy to generate the um, um, this uh, direction and the learning is then done in the other direction. And actually, we need the real word prices just in order to locate the lambdas where the reality happens. So it is just to pin down where the real market moves. Then you say, OK, these are lambdas I'm interested in. And then you perturb a little bit around and you get a huge set of training data. And then you learn the inverse. Funny is that this is actually, from the point of view of mathematics, a relatively complicated map. You know that solving an optimization problem is solving an inverse problem. And the solution of an inverse problem is usually um, complicated. You need to regularize that it is continuous. It, is, uh, uh, it could, in principle, also jump if you write down the problem in an imposed way. So there are, these are not easy maps from prices to parameters. And therefore, you use all these sophisticated optimizers in order to get that. But what is funny is that neural networks, with their implicit regularization, provide you on large training data set actually with a very nice, smooth interpolation through these uh, data points. It corresponds actually, from a point of view of calibration, and I think one can actually also prove that the neural network is a sort of Tikhonov regularized uh, solution of the calibration problem, which you let run very, very long time. Of course, the neural network is uh, uh, immediately now evaluated. So if you want to calculate now for a certain price configuration in reality what the lambda is, the evaluation of the neural network is immediately. Yeah. So this was the starting point. This was the so-called deep calibration problem. Learn the calibration function. But of course, you could also say, if you can learn the calibration function, that's a complicated direction. You could also learn this direction, learn the pricing function. Why not? Why is it sometimes interesting to learn a pricing function? It's always interesting if there is a complication in pricing. When do we have a complication in pricing? What is the most famous model where pricing is complicated? Of course, developed in Paris. Uh, uh, when you look at the 
rough volatility models. Rough volatility models are models where you have a stochastic volatility, but the stochastic volatility is a function of a fractional Brownian motion actually with a very low Hurst index, so a very rough uh, fractional Brownian motion. And when you simulate a trajectory of a rough uh, uh, of a fractional Brownian motion, which is very rough. I don't know if you ever did that. You will have a little surprise. It is not like usual simulation of a Brownian motion where you can generate yourself 10 million trajectories within a second. Mm -hmm. There it takes a second to generate one trajectory. And serious, it takes that. And it takes 10 million seconds in order to generate 10 million trajectories. So it gets very, very expensive. The, the reason is that there is an autocorrelation going on, and you actually have to, to generate a very complicated high dimensional Gaussian, which you have uh, to, to process, and it takes long. It is the pricing there, as the Monte Carlo pricing, is expensive, really expensive. It's the bottleneck of this beautiful. Uh, uh, class of uh, of models that the pricing is actually expensive and a couple of people said okay if the pricing is expensive we can learn the pricing functional just by doing the pricing once offline and then learn the map from parameters to the prices uh, directly. What are the parameters there? You have a Hurst index, you have a, a correlation there between the stochastic volatility and instantaneous correlation of the prices. And uh, you have some additional wall of wall parameter, but it's a low parameter. It's the word in machine learning for stochastic uh, or for stochastic optimization, you would say. And you calculate their value functions and optimal strategies. Strategies are called in machine learning policies. Optimal policies and value functions. Here we actually don't do that. So we do not calculate a value function here. And also we only take the scenarios generated starting from today's price and going into the future and try to get the policy optimal on those scenarios. We are not interested in a sort of uh, 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 in a market which starts at a different price today. And we also do not solve that problem. We solve just the problem which we actually are interested in. The market is at a certain state, and there I would like to learn the strategies. So in that sense it's simpler, and therefore also uh, less complex than uh, reinforcement learning. One should see this aspect also. Excuse me, could you redefine clearly what is it reinforcement learning? Is it a, a loop of uh, uh, a backward Reinforcement loop? learning is solving the Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation with uh, techniques from machine learning. <laughs> and sometimes the techniques come from, they, they are very classical techniques, so you would immediately recognize them from your courses in uh, stochastic optimization. So it's solving the Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation. What is the most important technique from machine learning? you store the information which is in the value function via a neural network. And therefore, due to the generalization properties, it is often like that, that you just learn the value function at a couple of points, but the generalization is so well that you know it then already in a whole neighborhood of those points, and therefore you can then somehow accelerate classical techniques. It's a beauty. It's really fascinating how it works, and you would say reinforcement learning is behind uh, the most uh, 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 outstanding progresses, for instance, uh, beating the Go World Champion. This is a reinforcement learning algorithm which is used there. But classically, it is solving the Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation by machine learning uh, 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 techniques. And in that sense, it is you use neural networks in order to store the information. This is a beautiful work, recent work of Charles Baer, uh, about learning rates and uh, reinforcement learning. So these are fascinating topics. I just want to make the point, this is, uh, this is a simpler problem. Therefore, it is a, a little bit less complex. I just wanted to say. 
Okay, what is deep portfolio optimization? Since I told you this all works so well, we can now say, okay, let's take a market environment with a couple of scenarios, but now we don't have a liability, or we might even have a liability. What we do not have is downwards risk. We think about opportunities. So we would like to find an optimal portfolio such that certain preferences are met, that the utility is getting maximal. Uh, can also be immediately implemented in this setting with precisely the same piece of code. The only thing is that reliability has a different meaning, might be there for in optimal portfolio theory, this is called the random endowment, might be there or not. And instead of talking about loss functions here, you talk about uh, expected utility. And since you always minimize here, you should talk about negative expected utility, which you would like to get as small as possible, but it's the same implementation and you can just uh, do that. Also here you have code on the web page, just go there, take a look, for instance, this optimal implementation of uh, the Merton model. What is the Merton model? This is Black Shores. Now we need the drift because otherwise the strategy is very simple, which you play. The optimal strategy is, is don't touch the market if there is no drift. But if there is a little bit of drift, there is of course an optimal solution, which is known since the days of Merton. Uh, he was, uh, uh, together with others, solving this optimal, this stochastic optimal control problem. And the question is, how large is this parameter alpha? this friction uh, of your total wealth which you have to invest into the market and this is the solution of the optimization problem. It is relatively easy to see that actually, even though it is not written here, alpha in general is a predictable strategy so it can be very complicated but if the utility is having some simple structures and everything is constant here you will see that the friction is actually a constant number and you can calculate it, it's a well-known Merton ratio. So we take that problem, and we take now, you are now already professionals, you know how it works, what do we do? First we generate our trajectories, let's look at one, there's a certain discretization going on here, not very fine, then uh, let me go a little bit further down here. Here you take your list of layers out of which you build the strategies. Yeah. As we had it always before, you have your list of layers and then you just grab by hand in the pool and build up the strategies. You have as an input the price Hatch is in order to make a uh, 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 statement from before, but actually it is not uh, it's, an it's an investment here, it's not a hatch, but it was just in order to compare it. And you get uh, input wealth, so this is before we had the price as an input, now it is a starting capital you have. And you can see that uh, you build up in precisely the same way the, um, the, the problem here and you can even make a random endowment I was playing a little bit with the code here I thought I used this random endowment but I was putting it right away to zero uh, just uh, um, uh, uh, wanted for this uh, implementation here not to have that additional. So then you initialize the model. You take 10 to the power 5, 100,000 scenarios. Build up the uh, training data set. The only little difference to before is before we had a, a standard loss which was squared 
green squared error, now we take a custom loss. This is also easy to define for us. And what is the custom loss which I take here? I take logarithmic utility. So I take the logarithm of the of the of the wealth at the end of the investment, and I want to get that uh, as large as possible. Yeah. And this is actually what is uh, then happening here. Remember, we always have gradient descent. So never forget to take the minus here. So we want a negative logarithmic expectation to be very small. And then you just insert this custom loss into your optimizer. Input, which is uh, a affine function. So the neural network, when you only have one node, looks like that. If you take a difference of two such functions, you can approximate this very well. So in that sense, in dimension one, it is very easy by neural networks to produce approximations of localized functions. How does that look in dimension two? Is it also easy to produce by shallow neural networks a uh, uh, localized function? And there the answer is no, not at all. Because you always have this, uh, this, uh, this affine input, and then you have a function of dimension one. So what you can produce, easily produce, is a function which, let's say, this, if this is the plane, which is like that. And if you subtract from such a function a slightly shifted function, you get a pump function, which is like that. But it has a complete uh, non-zero, non-localized aspect in one direction. It's only in one direction localized, but not in the other one. In order to create in dimension two a localized function by shallow neural networks, you need a tremendous amount of nodes. Therefore, only to get a look right, this is what you say. What you need to do is to make tak, 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 tak. You, make, you have to make the circle uh, by uh, a polygonal and then uh, uh, subtract on it. So you need a huge amount of nodes. What is if you have the right to use deep networks? Is it then easy to get the localized function? The answer is yes. Then it is very easy. There's a very simple way how to get in a two-dimensional situation, but not only in a two-dimensional situation, in a d-dimensional situation with a deep network of depths for a localized uh, function. And therefore, you see already with this example that deep networks with a very low amount of parameters approximate localized functions. This is one reason why one uses deep networks. No? Okay? So it just simplifies the approximation concept. No? And there you have depth 4. If you have depth 4, you can already easily localize. Yeah? Just dimension 2. Could you just uh, elaborate a little bit? With like a two layer network, how you can make this function. Like yeah. Just quickly. Like, how you would do it? Now, yeah. In dimension two, you take the difference, which has then one uh, non-localized direction. Then you take the orthogonal direction, you add them. Then you have a cross, mm -hmm. and then you apply a non-linearity on the cross, which only concentrates in the middle, and everything which is above, between one and two, it uh, takes, and everything which is below one, it puts to zero. And that's it. So it is a layer two in dimension two. Yeah. So this is an, a, a difference between shallow and deep. Depth is often very efficient in approximating. Yeah. But thank you for the question. It's important. I worked this out in uh, lecture one. At the end of lecture one, it's precisely described how you can approximate a wavelet basis by um, neural networks of depth four. Actually, it's not a wavelet basis, it's a frame, but uh, not to go too much. Lecture one, you see it at the end. This is, yeah. uh, OK, other questions? I have a small question. Please. Um, before you were showing um, a notebook with an optimization uh, uh, called uh, Black Scholes optimization or something. Yeah. And apparently, it's not linked to Black Scholes really. There is a part where you generate the Black Scholes 
uh, trajectories, but you could put any. Uh, yes, it has nothing to do. Right. Which scenarios you take, you're completely free. It is just I took Black Shores in order to know what the solution is and to compare the patching solution with the Black Shores solution, which is of course spot on if you have enough scenarios. But you can take any type of uh, data generating uh, machine. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, there's someone in Hong Kong who's listening to you. Maybe she, okay. She may. Thank you. Same thing for you. Thank you. Uh, so far, you uh, you presented problems where uh, you're not embarrassed with having uh, 600,000 parameters. No, I'm but, not embarrassed anymore. But, uh, anymore. But, uh, I was embarrassed for some time. But probably uh, in, in some industrial case, we, you might be interested in uh, finding a parsimonious parameter set. Yeah. Could we train a neural network to find a good uh, uh, function basis with a proper parameter set instead of solving the, directly the problem? What do you think? So you would ask, or you are asking whether in a certain market environment uh, a low dimensional parameter set is sufficient in order to capture the price. Yes, in a candid way. As you said, if we use a wavelet or uh, we have a preconceived idea of a, uh, the solution, whereas dimensionality is, uh, is too big, we, we are doomed to fail. But maybe... Uh, uh yeah, it's simple, but uh, the way how the back propagation is implemented, and the way... It's a simple algorithm, but in a super high dimensional situation. So this is a calculation in a hundred thousand dimensional space, and this is done in a very, very optimized way from the point of view of computer science. So I think if you are a very, very good programmer, you would be able after some years to come up with the type of code we would produce, but it took them a while. Because it is such a high dimensional thing, you have to take the network and come up with a certain way how to do the back propagation optimally and then uh, go through the uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So it's not an uh, easy piece of course which you easily uh, uh, reproduce. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Um, I was wondering, have you checked that as an input of the location strategies with certain pushing prices? Of course, I mean, you can say you do not have only one liability, you have uh, different liabilities with different names, and depending which you have, you will take it as an input. Yes. In fact, the question was that the ST was quite generic, I mean, you generated. Yeah. You can see it as the stock price, but it could be the option price. It could also be the option price, of course. Yeah. So if you hedge with respect, if you take options as hedging and instruments, it's only traded vehicles. Whatever you have as a trading thing, you put there. The only requirement is that the model is arbitrage free. Otherwise, the artificial trader, after some time, will find out the arbitrage and then goes to the roof. Other questions? And how about the auditability of this? Uh, I mean, as a bank, we, we, we are required to, to, to be able to prove that we did something because we are not doing proper, proper trading or whatever. We need to show to regulators that, uh, that what we do is uh, it's not client and it's not uh, prop trading, but it's uh, proper trading, but it's client agent. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can in function, and then your regulator or auditor might come and say, "Okay, I want to see whether the strategy is really good." I stress you a little bit. I do not use a stochastic volatility environment that takes a gauge, and I look how your strategy performs there. And this robustness you can actually enforce by already putting a little bit of gauge or different types of models in the scenario generating machine. You're completely free what you put there 
in order to get better performances also on, uh, on, on, on different types of trajectories. So you can easily work with mixture models. And then, of course, this is the histogram or the distribution of the wells at the end of time is the argument which tells, okay, on those scenarios it actually performs well. It's not always like that in machine learning that you have an assessment of the quality of the solution which is actually convincing. Sometimes you just don't know what the good solution is. Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. yes, um, how do you know that uh, the architecture of a uh, neural network is, is good? Uh, I, uh, I don't know, science. but <laughs> let's say the little theorem which we proved or which I tried to explain you in the morning tells actually architecture matters maybe less than we believe because we were saying actually uh, a deep uh, neural network with random uh, layers where you only train scaling factors of each layer is already expressive. So this is a very generic architecture. It's the most generic architecture, just depth. Mm. But of course, in reality, to get really good solutions, architecture matters. Mm. Well, when you look at what happened in, uh, in vision, for example, in yeah. the inception, initially we had um, a set of very deep uh, convolutional yeah. layers. It was working well, but still a little bit of errors. And yeah. it's only when we added the skip connection that we Absolutely. No, get I, I would say architecture matters a lot if you want really to have a very good solution. We never really experimented with architecture in this deep hatching or deep uh, portfolio optimization environment because already the solutions which we obtained were relatively good. We were happy with it. But it's, I think it's an easier problem than in image recognition, this hatching problem. Because the functions are much more regular, which you obtain as hatching ratios in comparison to the functions you need to, to classify images. And so architecture, I would say, matters maybe a little bit less. But I'm not sure about it. Might as well be that somebody, if you play a week with it, you say, this is the architecture we should use, and then you get some very good results. So it's impossible. And um, do you think that when we finally found um, a hedging strategy and so a set of hedge for a certain uh, option uh, using a different uh, neural network would uh, converge to the same set of hedges or it could be completely different? No, hedges. I think it would uh, go to, I mean, if you are in a complete environment, so where, where, you, uh, where you have essentially one Theoretically speaking, one hedging strategy, whatever architecture you have, it will give the same function after long enough training. Well, in an ideal world, but in reality, we know that the market is not complete. Yes, if it is not complete, you have preferences. These preferences help you to choose uh, um, strategies, and then it might well happen that you just. Um, yeah, but it should, as, as long as the problem is uh, well defined and has a unique solution, it will find, both will find the same. It is, uh, as you see it with the parabola, if you take a, a neural network of depth 3 or 15, it will both find the parabola on the training data set. Yeah, but this problem is completely differentiable and it, it's... Uh, it, hatching strategies are relative. Hatching strategies are in terms of the... Of the, of the path as a relatively nice function. When you look at the delta hatch, it's a relatively nice function in terms of the price. It looks almost like a neural network when you think about it, because it is the error function of uh, uh, the Gaussian, and inside you have a logarithm of the current price minus logarithm of uh, strike price. So this is a neural network actually in the log price plus some factors. But uh, in reality, you would like to take into account uh, additional constraints. And for example, the ability to edge in Vega. 
yeah. and uh, taking into account transaction costs, liquidity issues. And makes so it more complicated. Yeah, and then you might have non-unique solutions, and then different networks might find different yeah. solutions. This is true. Yeah, this is true. As soon as you are leaving the world of uniquely defined uh, problems, then you will have different networks finding different solutions. Like Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so you say that uh, this hedge will replicate uh, the hedge of, of this upgraded mod. Yeah. Uh, what if I uh, try to uh, uh, train on the real day? So I uh, realize that uh, there is no that much uh, historical uh, data to train a large amount of parameters. Yeah. But uh, have you had an experience of uh, training uh, of, of, of using uh, both uh, real data and simulated uh, data, for example? I mean, and real data in terms of prices are just one trajectory, so this is one scenario. If you only train on one scenario, your hatching strategy will be good on that scenario, and that's it. So you need more. Yeah, but then you take some assumption and you say, for instance, your, let's say log returns are stationary and therefore you can take uh, log returns many years ago and now and compare them and say and generate actually with such a methodology uh, by historical simulation some scenarios. But you need to have a way how to generate scenarios. You cannot make this type of uh, optimization only data driven. I'm thinking about uh, the material that, that approaches that integrate uh, the real data into uh, the training time process and uh, try to uh, uh, discretize between the real distribution and the simulated one. Yeah. And probably that, that will uh, contribute to, uh, to the final uh, distribution uh, using the historical data. I mean, what we usually do is we look at the historical time series, we estimate a model out of the historical time series, and then we generate from this model. Yeah. This will be. Yes, you can take one of the scenarios to historical time series, but then it is one of the many scenarios. I have another question. It's more uh, about uh, production. Yes. How often do you revise the, this learning? Like, uh, you have trained the neural network yeah. in production. Do you retrain it uh, or is it uh, trained forever? I mean, I see it like that. You sell a certain liability, you receive a premium, and you receive the premium according to the uh, learning result which you obtained yesterday afternoon when you did the training. Then you receive the premium and you set up your portfolio and you let it run. There's no recalibration necessary except you have a radically changing market environment. And you would say, okay, my volatility went through the roof and therefore my assumptions on the underlying scenarios are so bad that I need to rethink. So then you would take the value of your hedging portfolio and ask with this value and new scenarios, can you, what is an optimal hedge? And then you might have to change. Okay. In reality, you would like to have because you can also check what the model would say. The training after some time, where should you be, and what you see in reality. If this is far off, then you can say, okay, I have to do something. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, did you uh, come up to compare with uh, actual strategies followed by traders? Let's say complex strategies and found that uh, machine learning uh, is doing better in the trade. Um, I always had greatest respect for traders and quants, and I believe they, they find very, very good uh, strategies. Some people tried that to look whether machine learning technology can actually find sophisticated strategies, and what I can report, but I never tried it myself, is that it is said, yes, some sophisticated strategies actually are found by machines. The funny thing is with machines is they also find strategies human beings did not think so far about, in particular in high dimensional markets, because even though traders are very good and intelligent and they are uh, uh, coming up with sophisticated, intelligent solutions of uh, trading problems, it often works in a one, two, ten dimensional environment, but if you ask what is a very intelligent strategy in a 235 dimensional market, where you have so and so many uh, traded quantities, this is probably rather a machine which will be able to find it. But if you take the example of the chess game, no one was expecting the machine to be the man. At the end of the day, we have the yes. machine doing better. So I would also expect that this is the and case for that. This will, happen in, the future this will future. happen in also in the future. I just was answering scientifically if I myself was checking that, and the answer is no. If I believe that this will come, yes, of course, there will be superhuman uh, traders, artificial traders. <laughs> uh, when should we expect this? <laughs> this I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if somebody, if the machine is able to beat uh, the Go World Champion, of course it can also beat the trader. Maybe. I mean, because the same level. Because <laughs> <laughs> traders are also very intelligent. Don't you think that because it's the rules are given for the chess and go, there are rules? True. There are, there are, there are uh, rather simple rules, in fact. Uh, yeah. The complexity comes from the, the combination, not exact. But uh, in finance, in fact, there are no rules. There are no written rules. So. Yeah. I'm not so sure if the difference is really the... I believe that Go, even so rules are simple, is very complex as an uh, optimization problem. In that sense, one has to search through many different possibilities yeah, in order to find something optimal. That's the complexity. And okay. in that sense, uh, you might have similar situations in financial markets. You have to search through many different trading strategies in order to find out sophisticated new ones. Yeah, but for portfolio selection machines are rather better than, in fact, humans. It's a combinatorial problem. Yeah. So machines are better in this, but when there, there, there are fuzzy rules and uh, yeah. you need to discover uh, new things. Uh, it might be that it might take a while change, still uh, until machines can do that, but I see no principal reason why it should not be. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, where human beings are so far, as so the numerical technology was not at all advanced, is our games. Stochastic games where you have a market, let's say, with 10 participants, they all have their different preferences, and you would like to know how this equilibrium works. There's no good numerics for that, and we think, I think we will see first time, very soon, uh, machine learning results in the direction where those equilibria are just learned. Yes? Yeah, uh, uh, I have a couple of questions, please. So, uh, you can ask them one after the other. Sure. Um, so um, I, I was I was thinking, what would be the sensitivity of, uh, of the optimal edge to the activation function? Uh, so uh, it's a similar question as before. Activation function, you can say, is part of architecture. So we so you include it into the architecture. Yes. And in that sense, you would say if you have different activation functions, a unique solution of your problem, it should approximate it. It might take a little bit longer for that activation function, it might go quicker for other ones, but in principle, it should yield similar solutions. Okay. Um, and um, you were talking about the, uh, the uh, efficiency of, uh, of uh, those networks, especially if you have a high dimensional problem. 200, yeah. 300, etc. However, the, the rule of the game changes in financial markets. So, 
you might have somebody cheating, you might have fat fingers, you might have what we call non-stationarity. Yeah. While for the Go or the chess games, this is not rules exists. are known. Yeah. So how, how, uh, how can we make sure that it is uh, robust to mm -hmm. those uh, things? I mean, it can only be robust towards uh, it's been trained for. predefined ways of changes. So if you believe in a certain uh, view on the market that you say there might be regime changes, but these are the, what I can see, then you can create a robust deep hatching which can deal with that. Uh, if you don't include that into your training, you can as well not expect that it does it by itself. So, but it's also like uh, um, it's an artificial trader. It's like a real trader. A real trader also, if she only learned on Black Shoals type uh, 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 markets how to trade, and was doing that very often, it is very very successful there. And suddenly, you give. Uh, uh, a price generating process which looks really different, it will take a while until she finds out. You have to always to imagine it like that, but there's no principal reason why you could not come up with something robust if you know in which direction you have to robustify. Okay? These were only two questions. <laughs> One a short series. <laughs> Uh, you know that right now neural networks use a lot of sample uh, data sets, usually are huge. Yeah. Uh, do you think that with deep hedging, we could, and, and, but in the same time, there are people who are thinking about few sample alone, that yeah. mean the ability to, to learn for, from just a few cases. Yeah. Do you think that we could do the same with deep hedging? Um. I don't know. I mean, the scenarios have to have to uh, in this approach. The scenarios have to cover a certain part of your underlying space in order to have information there. If you only have, let's say, one trajectory, which would be the uh, case of the question before by Sergey, uh, you will only learn along this trajectory. If the trajectory, by chance, goes through a lot of uh, scenarios then you learn something along that, but it does not really help for the hatching problem, because the hatching problem is also something where you have the final time, and um, so I'm not, I think there it is delicate, but I will give you an instance in one and a half hours for um, learning on one trajectory, but this is something different. I'll show you one example where that works. Just a quick one. Uh, while integrating the transaction cost, does your engine, uh, uh, I believe your engine w would tell you where, when to edge? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay, if that's not the case. I continue now in a, a relatively wild and different direction. You will be a little bit surprised what happens uh, now. And uh, it relates also to the question which uh, was addressed a couple of times, learning on small amounts of uh, parameters. Actually, it is a little bit cheating, but it looks as if I did it. And I want to introduce you also to something which is keeping my attention since a long time already. It's a field called Reservoir Computer. Who has ever heard about that? You know? <laughs> reservoir Computer. So this is uh, actually an old field in machine learning. It's about 20 years old. Uh, there were a couple of researchers, for instance Herbert Jäger 
Wolfgang Maas in Austria and Germany, people are coming up who is a following concept or paradigm of learning. So what is learning? Very often learning is like that. You have an input x, you have a map to an output y, f is this map, and you want to approximate this map by a neural network. This is supervised learning. The suggestion of uh, Herbert Jäger and uh, Wolfgang Maas and a couple of other people is uh, so very classically machine learning, but with a particular caveat. Split this map into two parts. One map is going from x to an intermediate variable, let's call it z here, and the other goes from z to y. The second map is just linear. It's a linear map coming with just a matrix. And the first one has nothing to do with the f. This is a sort of generic uh, machine learning, you say, feature extraction. You take x, this is some high dimensional vector. You map the x on, for instance, all possible polynomials you can form in x. And then you have a linear readout which maps to the y and approximates that. So, this is, of course, from the analysis point of view, something very simple. For instance, imagine capital F is an uh, analytic function. An analytic function, one variable. We know you can write the analytic function, of course, as a power series in polynomials of this variable with coefficients, which are the, the, the relative <coughs> value of the, of the base form. So you could say this map, this reservoir map here, uh, can be written like that. You map every x to all possible polynomials, and on the polynomials you have then a linear map which is producing the, 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 the analytic functions. So actually this idea is, uh, mathematically speaking, very clear. Uh, often we have such situations. Sorry. They called the map on the left the reservoir, and here we have already uh, a wording which we know this is the readout. So we have the reservoir and the readout. Well, the machine learning would say the feature extractor and the linear regression on the features. So far, so not exciting. But now, something a little bit exciting, more exciting comes very often in machine learning you have situations where actually the input is not a finite dimensional vector, but the input is a time series. So imagine now that the input is not a vector, but it is actually coming uh, as a sequence. And the sequence might uh, have a length, which is, uh, uh, you always get new data in. And the output is also a sequence. And the map here is a nonlinear map from one sequence to the others. And this is actually the reason why those guys in reservoir computing were looking at that. They say, OK, we map x, this incoming sequence, to another sequence set, which are the extracted features of x. And then we have, again, a linear readout, which maps set to y. Excuse me, the parameter of every, the entire sequence or just one element of the sequence? It's uh, the, entire sequence. the entire sequence. So what is an example which you all know from your uh, daily work? Imagine time series, Garch, a Garch model, or take a Black-Scholes model. Then the input would be the Brownian motion or the, the, the standardized uh, noises. The output is the time series. So this is the price time series. And, well, this is exciting to say you can write, for instance, Garch as a linear regression on some features. And you get precisely the same result. So there also this map is called the reservoir because it stores information about x in, a, in an intelligent way, and the w is called the yeah? 
Uh, this was a little bit before Google uh, entered fully the field, so this was about 20 years ago when computational power was actually an issue. And of course this is something interesting because you only have to do a regression here in order to uh, learn this nonlinear map because this one is uh, calculated without any training. There are two funny aspects in reservoir computing which make the thing exciting. First, this map is very often chosen randomly. Random and untrained. And um, second, it works extremely well in cases where one actually would really not expect it. So this is, uh, when was it invented? About 50 or 20 years ago. There was one issue in numerics. This was the prediction, long-term prediction of chaotic dynamical systems. So chaotic dynamical system, dynamical system where actually you need to crank forever with your computer in order to get the value at time one. Because a tiny little error blows up immediately and you have to discretize it to a fine minimum such that you get it. And what they actually managed is in such chaotic systems to write a reservoir computing approach which was beating any sort of numerical technology by, by uh, orders of magnitude. Um, there are uh, several examples uh, from physics I could talk a little bit about, but I want to make a connection as to something which you might have realized recently in the newspaper, even though the approach is not reservoir computing, but it shows a little bit also that machine learning technology works. You recently might have seen that there was a paper in Archive uh, where it was about the prediction of outcomes of the three-body problem. The three-body problem is a well-known uh, dynamical system since so the days of Newton. People are cranking in that. And the question is stability, chaoticity. We know that there is a chaotic behavior. We know that we have to be very, very refined in order to get a good prediction 1, 10, uh, 50 years ahead. And what uh, some researchers, I think, in UK were showing is that you can actually train a neural network which does the prediction and to an incredible uh, uh, um, precision. Training is, of course, data where you say, OK, uh, um, you solve this equation a couple of times, relatively short into the future, and then you just concatenate that together. And you look, how is the prediction in comparison to a precise calculation? And it is very, very good. You could say this is one other instance, even though it was not formulated in the setting of reservoir computing, but you have predictions of chaotic dynamical systems where you take the input. The input in the Newton problem, the three-body problem, is just time. So this time series here is just constant, just time. Take the input, map it to uh, something uh, relatively complicated, uh, intermediate uh, output here and then make a regression on that and this will predict in a very funny way for a very long time into the future. This is the paradigm of reservoir computing. Uh, as I said, pre-computer technology, uh, pre-Google technology because it was also at this time the issue only to have a regression. Works well. Uh, why is it still so interesting in in our times where we have now this nonlinear way of training and all these uh, great uh, 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 training uh, software. Why is it still interesting? There is one thing which we also discussed yesterday a little bit in the evening. There is the question of uh, does training have something to do with the functionalities of the human brain? Even if it conceptually does have something to do, the way how we do it does not because it is, from a point of view of energy consumption, much more energy consuming what my computer is doing than what my brain is doing when I get trained a certain task. When you compare the amount of energy a computer needs in order to do a task of a human being, 
in processing information, you have, I think, uh, order of magnitude 10 to the power 6 between. So in comparison, you live, or me today, I live from water and uh, coffee, <laughs> so I don't need much energy to, to uh, process information. Uh, actually, this, uh, we have a low energy consumption in comparing to the immense neural network which we are uh, carrying around with <coughs> us and which has been trained and which is evaluated all the time. If you were mimicking that on a computer, it's, uh, it's not just coffee and water what it needs. It needs uh, 10 to the power 6 times the amount of energy to do the same task. In reservoir computing, uh, people ask themselves whether the human brain has features of such a type. This is sort of a uh, uh, reservoir computing approach. But finally, there is a random extraction of features and then a linear readout which is trained, which is, of course, much cheaper the non-linear training. And therefore, they are always working in this area, not only having this map here, this non-linear map, prescribed and calculated, they also realize it sometimes through physical experiments. So they say, I take a time series, I modulate a time series on a laser, with a certain uh, way how you, uh, how you include the information there, I sent the laser through an experiment, a random experiment in the sense that there are angles of mirrors and certain nonlinearities. But the laser is running through this, produces then a, an output which is just a, a distribution of intensities and amplitudes. And then you make a regression on that output in order to learn. And this is a low energy way of uh, producing uh, trained. Uh, non-linear representations. And of course the, the dream in the future is to have actually a biological representation of that, which one believes is the lowest energy. Because optical experiments lie just between them. They need 10 to the power 3 times the amount of uh, energy. But one believes actually that there should be something one knows that there is something. We are like that where you have actually um, this, uh, this map here realized uh, a biological or biochemical. And you probably heard about this blue brain project where parts of the human brain are mimicked with digital computers, and this is precisely the approach they are using. So they make this random, yes? Yeah, I assume uh, the Z function couldn't be completely independent of F. It should work for a set of functions. It will be surprisingly independent of F. It is as independent of F as... What, what if uh, the Y function happens to be a quadratic function of Z? Yes. So how would this would be a contradiction of what you assume? So if Y is the square of X... Y happens to be... Let's say F could be any function. So yeah. Let's say Y is the quadratic function of, of Z. Yes. No, it's not the quadratic. Yeah but, yeah, but this would be a contradiction of the assumption that y would be a linear function. Of I give you a, a simple example and you will say, okay, <laughs> uh, if you see it like that, I believe you. Take z is all polynomials. If you take the square of all polynomials, you are still inside of all polynomials. Okay, so that means every so mode that you need to include all polynomials, otherwise it doesn't work. Algebraically speaking, you need to create a set of features which is closed under algebraic operations. For instance, you take the set of all polynomials, then of course the square of this is also. Yeah. 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 So you're right. Excuse me, does it have to do something with auto coding uh, Yes, you can uh, relate it to autoencoders too. But uh, um, often there you go to a lower dimensional space and you reconstruct. Here you go to actually very high dimensional space and then you regress. But you can see in some respects also similarities. Yeah, there are many cases where we create an auto encoder and get rid of the uh, decoder. Yeah. Keeping only the encoder. Yeah. So here would be the same. We keep the encoder 
and do something with uh, what remains. Yeah, yeah. No, it is there. There is a relationship to that. Still, here the the the, the emphasis is that we have only a linear training problem. And there is another aspect which you will see. I will show you one example, which you all know from your daily life, where actually the generalization properties of this are incredible. You learn a very small amount of data, and you have learned it everywhere. This we will see. So, so um, so this is this uh, uh, paradigm of, uh, of uh, reservoir computing. Split the nonlinearity you want to learn, the linear readout, and a nonlinear map which has actually universal features but has nothing to do with the particular function you want to learn. Yeah? Now we take uh, an instance where you know what is going on. And we try, in this instance where you know what is going on, to construct a reservoir. Then we will convince ourselves that this is actually a good reservoir, does the job, but it is very expensive to calculate. And then we find a cheap to calculate replica of this good reservoir. And with this we can work. So let me, let me, let me go in that direction. This is lecture, I think, number five. Deep simulation. Even though deep networks only appear in the sense that it can be interpreted as a deep network, there is no training of deep networks. It is just the linear regression would be doing. So, again, our good friend, the controlled ordinary differential equation appears, but now we look again at this setting from a different angle. The angle from which we look at it is now the following. You fix the vector fields. They are fixed. You don't think of uh, neural networks or something like that, but you think of some dynamics, and you are interested in the map from the control to the solution. So this is precisely the situation from before the x is the control, the solution y is the solution of this equation, and you are interested in this nonlinear map which is mapping from the control to the solution. Like the gauge innovations, how they are mapped to the prices, or how the Brownian motion is mapped through Black Shores to the, uh, to the prices or to the log prices, this map, we are interested in this map. And the question is, is there a reservoir computing-like way to learn this map? The classical way in machine learning, how people would learn this map, is the following. They would take a so-called recurrent network. A recurrent network is, if you want to say it in our language, nothing else than an ordinary differential equation, which is discretized. And then you just learn the neural network which approximates the vector fields. This is called the cell, the recurrent cell. So a recurrent network is nothing else than a discretized ordinary differential equation, and when you train the recurrent network, you actually learn the cell, you learn the vector. I claim that there is also another approach which is much easier, which does a very similar job. And this I want to explain in the next, uh, let's say, in the next uh, hour, how that works. So we want to learn this map control u to the solution process x without entering the beauty but also difficulty of your current networks. And therefore, we use a funny sort of Taylor expansion. This is, of course, something which goes back to famous names, Gerard Benarouf, Michel Lies, uh, people who worked in dynamic systems, they were writing down Taylor expansions of this type of uh, equation in terms of the control. So you want to know how does the control x influence where, how does the control u influence where the, where the dynamic system goes. 
And the idea is very simple. As for classical Taylor expansion, you write the equation in integral form. And you use a little bit of uh, notation, which is um, uh, to be um, introduced. This is the equation in integral form. The only thing you might ask me is, Joseph, what does that mean? I have the vector field vi applied to the function. What is that? This is an abbreviation for the gradient of the function scalar product of the vector field. I just abbreviated like that. Sometimes called the transport operator. So this is the gradient of f multiplied with the function with the direction. And of course, this is nothing else than the chain rule. If I have a test function applied on the solution of the equation, you calculate the derivative of that. The derivative is, of course, the derivative of x. So this is the ordinary differential equation multiplied with the gradient of f at this point. This is precisely what we have here, and this is the integral form. Now, what is the beauty of this uh, equation? The beauty of this equation is the following. I have a test function applied on x, and I can write it as, no, I'm sorry, there's a mistake here. There should be an f of x. This is, of course, not. We have an f of x here, and we have here another test function, which is applied on the equation. So I could say, if this equation is true, I can insert this equation at this point. I insert the equation into itself. The oldest trick of analysis, you have an equation which holds for functions, for certain functions, and on both sides of the equation, functions appear. You can insert the equation into itself. So let's do that. We write for this function the whole formula. So this means vi f at the point x plus the integral from 0 to s now. And now I have two vector fields applied on f. And I have a double integral. If you sit down, if you are well concentrated, if you did not drink too much wine last night, you will be able to set up a formula which looks like that. So actually, when you insert a number m of times, you end up with iterated integrals of the component of the control with respect to itself, different components here and here, i1 up to ik, time t1 up to tk, you have this uh, this uh, simplex here, 0, less or equal to 1, less or equal up to tk, less or equal to t. And you have here iterated applications of the vector fields on the function. So vik corresponds to the outermost integral, and then you just go here into it. Now, you would say, nice, this is an expansion, an expansion of my test function applied on the solution of the equation, and this expansion splits in a very nice way the action of the control and the particular nature of the dynamical system. It splits it off. The action of the control is encoded fully in the iterated integrals. And the action of the particular dynamics is encoded fully in the coefficients. So you have split actually in two parts. One part is the reservoir. I take u and I map it to all iterated integrals. And then I have a linear map on all iterated integrals, which is just encoding the particular dynamics. And now the uh, observation of our colleague in row number three is, uh, uh, of course, very valid. The iterated integrals by the example our colleague said, need necessarily to have the property that any polynomial of an iterated integral can be written as a linear combination of iterated integrals. This is, of course, true, even though it has to be proved. Uh, but this is precisely the property you have. So otherwise, it could not work that you have an abstract dynamics which you can write linearly over the iterated integrals. So at the end of this, uh, 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 lecture now, the third part of uh, today's lecture, I just 
uh, leave you for the coffee break by saying there is a very nice instance of reservoir computing in time series analysis and it works like that input are standardized noises imagine here Brownian motion the reservoir is just map the input the standardized noise to the iterated integrals and here is the equation which you would like to learn so the equation is given by those vector fields this you would like to learn and the statement is it is sufficient to learn this regression matrix M on the iterated integrals in order to represent this dynamics as I said well known old result and as it is often with old results uh, beautiful true you can prove it but there is some aspect of that it does not really work very well what is the problem with the iterated integrals and this is should make you coming back after the break uh, uh, when I show you the solution of it what is the problem with iterated integrals it is difficult to calculate them if you want to calculate iterated integrals of length 25 first there are many of them namely d to the power 25 because order matters so if d is equal to 2 and you go to 25 it's 2 to the power 25 that's already a sad news but <laughs> also in order to calculate them you need to go very fine in your path and you have to yeah. so as often in mathematics uh, result is beautiful, result is true, but of course completely useless. Uh, we will make it useful afterwards. The theoretical reservoir can be actually mimicked by a very tractable low dimensional object which has almost the same properties. And this is what I want to show. And this is now not having these properties, but approximating test. Yeah? Okay, I'll leave you for the for the for the last break. Thank you. Thank you. It's a big compliment that you're still here. Uh, it's a long day, and we are entering the last uh, part of the lecture. Now, uh, I also enjoyed. I have to say it, uh, directly now. I love the question session before. Very good questions, also very inspiring to discuss these aspects with you. And also in the, in the breaks, there are always very interesting questions. So the last theme is recent research related to reservoir computing. And reservoir computing, as I was introducing it before, is a paradigm of machine learning, actually an old paradigm of machine learning, where you have as input of the time series, which is mapped to a reservoir state, usually high dimensional state, and it's a nonlinear map. And this reservoir state is then rich enough, expressive enough to allow to understand this uh, output here as a regression of the reservoir state. And training here only is a regression, the reservoir is not trained at all. It's not completely true, it's a tiny little bit tuned, but it is mainly untrained. Yeah. So this is uh, the general situation and the particular situation, I said, we can actually encounter in the world of controlled ordinary differential equation, in the world of uh, stochastic differential equation, a reservoir in this setting would be all iterated integrals and the regression coefficients you can even calculate these are these vector fields applied to the, to the test function so there you know precisely what it is and you can prove that this uh, actually this the vector of all iterated integrals has a name the name was given by Terry Lyon about 20 years ago it's called a signature vector signature vector it's a signature of the path 
this is uh, why he used it there. And he was referring to older literature, but he was using it as a starting point of rough path theory. You can also take this theory as a starting point of rough path theory for understanding how rough can a path be such that you can still make sense of iterative integrals and then understand solutions of rough differential equation via this uh, um, map here. So therefore you should also see that this type of machine learning is very much related also to analysis, stochastic analysis and modern developments in analysis. <coughs> and the other way around, when we look what the Oxford group around Terry Lyons is doing scientifically, you see a lot of analysis, a lot of rough paths, and a lot of machine learning. And one of the reasons is this. Yeah. They do beautiful stuff. So, um, let us now ask the question whether whether it is possible to find a, a replica, a version of the iterative integrals which we can also easily calculate. As I said before, iterative integrals are a conceptually great object, but they are difficult to calculate because you need to know the path in a very fine grid in order to be able to calculate such an integral, and there are many different integrals. So do we find um, replica approximations of the vector of iterated integrals which have almost the same property of being a good regression basis? This is the question. And when we started to think about this question, um, I, at some point, came across a discussion of a couple of people, and these people were mentioning a cute little result to me, which helped me then a lot to go further in that. Who has ever heard of the so-called Johnson Lindenstrauss Lemma. Who has ever heard that? Johnson Lindenstrauss Lemma. You might have heard it, uh, there's a field uh, in uh, image processing which is called compressed sensing. So this is a way how to encode high dimensional information in low dimensional uh, ways and then to decode that. Encode it in something low dimensional, decode it. And this Low dimensional uh, encoding is actually done with this Johnson Linton Strauss uh, method very often. So, what is the Johnson Linton Strauss method? It does the following thing. Look at the theorem. The theorem has the following thing I give you a set of n points. Yeah? I give you a set of n points, A, in some space Rm. Yeah? M, you should imagine high dimension and could even be infinite dimension. And I give you the following task find please a map pi from this high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space such that the low dimensional projection of these n points in the low dimensional space have almost the same distances as in the high dimensional space. So, in other words, you have a point cloud in the high dimensional space and you would like to find a point cloud in the low dimensional space which has the same distances, almost. So the mathematical question is, does there exist a map pi from Rm to Rk such that the distance is x of x and y, so x minus y, the L2 norm, <coughs> is approximately the distance of pi x minus pi y and approximately is measured by an accuracy epsilon which you give yourself at the beginning. Of course, such a map exists, you could take the identity and then you have perfect epsilon. The interesting thing comes with the fact that the space Rk, which you have here, should be very, very low dimension. Mm -hmm. And what Johnson and Lindenstrauss proved is you can actually take a dimension which goes with the logarithm of the number of points. Yeah, this is what it is. 
Uh, why is this uh, a little bit astonishing? Just to tell you what the theorem uh, means. So if you see it like that, you would say, well, this is another theorem with me what people in abundance space geometry proved and therefore it is uh, you cannot really appreciate is it interesting, difficult, true, wrong let's turn it the other way around we are in RK and uh, the statement says in RK you find e to the power k almost orthogonal vectors. You find in Rk e to the power k almost orthogonal vectors because the embedding is actually in Rk. If you start with an Rm which is infinite dimensional you can of course take there a finite number of orthogonal vectors. You can embed it with this mapping so this means in Rk you find e to the power k almost orthogonal vectors. So this is a fact of high dimensional geometry just telling Almost orthogonality is actually realizable in relatively small dimensional space, even though the number of vectors is very large. Yeah. So you see, this is a statement which tells the logarithm of the number of points is enough in order to embed a geometry almost. Uh, now you would say, okay, uh, funny statement, my whole. Uh, peaceful uh, vision of uh, high dimensional space is, is now thrown into the garbage <laughs> I believe you that it is like that but what can we do with this statement now the statement is of course really, uh, used when you have a high dimensional object which you somehow don't want to store in that way and you take a low dimensional replica of it which is then easier to store okay. and yeah, this is first thing, clear, but always with such theorems in mathematics we are accustomed to beautiful mathematical theorems which are completely useless because you cannot use the theorem since it is difficult to construct such a map. So how is it here? Can we actually construct this map pi? And the beautiful answer here is actually yes, very explicit, it's a random matrix. You take a random matrix, you apply the random matrix to this point set, and then with a very high probability the random matrix will have this property. This is what Johnson and Lindenstrauss proved, and the random matrix is a Gaussian random matrix, and you have a certain scaling of it, but it has a Gaussian random matrix has actually the property that with high probability for any given n point set it maps the geometry almost to the same geometry in the low dimensional space. This is a relative of the mathematical statement if you take two randomly generated vectors, large vectors, with a high probability they are almost orthogonal. Just the, this is the central limit theory. No large numbers. So, uh, Similar statement here, concentration of measure is behind. So actually, not only that such maps exist, we can also construct them. Good. Now, we have this, our now already close friend, signature. So signature is the collection of all iterative integrals. This is a high dimensional object by all means of what the word high dimensional can mean. It is an infinite dimensional object because there are infinitely many guys. Can we find a projection of signature which has almost the same properties and which is easy to calculate? Easy to calculate is the additional thing because here, always with this method, you somehow need to know the high dimensional guy in order to calculate the projection. So we ask ourselves, can you project signature down, but only calculate downwards what you actually have there? And this is a theorem which we, which took us a little while to get it. Um, I formulated maybe in the utmost uh, mathematical way. Let me look at it. 
here. At the end of this uh, this webpage, we have I have some some talks here of mine. This is one talk I gave last week in Oslo. And in this talk, I talked about this uh, random signature method. And I just want to show you the formula. So there you see, we have precisely the same situation. The map from the controls to the solution, this is what we want to learn. We have this funny non-commutative Taylor expansion, which allows us to understand that signature, the vector of all iterative integrals, actually is a reservoir. As I said, going back to Chen, Benarus, Lyons, to name a couple of people. And then the question, can we use this johnson newton strauss lemma, which I just uh, made you believe and also appreciate, can we use that in order to get a low dimensional replica of signature which has almost the same geometry? And the statement which you finally can prove is the following thing. So what you do is, first you understand, signature is the solution of a dynamical system. Signature itself is a, is a iterative integrals, but if you think about what the iterative integrals uh, are, if you take the derivative with respect to time of the iterative integrals, you also have iterative integrals with a slight shift, and therefore you see a dynamical system structure there. So signature is a dynamical system. So we are actually ask the question, can we construct a low dimensional solution of this dynamical system, which looks almost like the dynamical system upwards. And this is actually what happens. I take the dynamical system, I describe it algebraically. This is a language I don't introduce here. It's a language of hot algebra, which you need here in order to take it. And I construct a low dimensional system, which is running in RK. This is my johnson linden strauss map. This is the adjoint of the johnson linden strauss map. So this goes from RK to the space where signature lives. Then I have the vector field, which is related to signature, and then I project it back. And we can prove that actually this low dimensional dynamical system, due to this johnson linden strauss properties, has almost the same properties as the high dimensional guy. And this is proved like that. Signature minus the embedding of this signature with the adjoint of the johnson linden strauss map actually is small. There's an epsilon here. And if the initial values are the same, this is actually uh, bounded by epsilon. And the epsilon comes from johnson linden strauss This is an uh, uh, autoencoder. You could say f maps from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space, F star maps it back, and this guy actually will be very close to almost an identity. But the low dimensional object has the same properties as the high dimensional object. And here we have a dynamic version of it. It's a dynamic system version. Now the question is, you might tell me, Joseph, nice, you project it down, but Whoever will calculate me this uh, funny vector field here in the low-dimensional system, how can I get that? I have two random matrices, and I have an algebraic operation, which is actually not so easy to describe. And the funny thing here is, if you calculate how this matrix looks in terms of set, it actually just looks like a random matrix, period. Again. So, the theorem at the end, then, is the following. Take random matrices A i and beta i, solve this system here in a low dimensional space, so this will run in R k, and regress the high dimension, the, the, uh, then you know that this has similar properties than signature itself, and you can try to make a regression on those paths in order to represent the dynamics. This is uh, the method. And this method is so nice that one has to immediately code it and uh, look how it works in reality. Because this is um, 
Yeah, just important to see at this point. So, um, what do I do? First, I have some uh, NumPy, SciPy. So, Then I make a dynamics. The dynamics is here a relatively complicated dynamics where I have a, a two-dimensional uh, dynamical system driven by a Brownian motion and a relatively complicated nonlinear dynamics. I show it to you, but you will immediately forget it, how it looks like and it is also not having a particular meaning. Is. The important thing is I can generate from this dynamics paths. The red paths are Brownian motions. The green paths are the solutions of this equation along this Brownian motion. How do I calculate it? Just an Euler scheme. An Euler scheme along this Brownian motion I calculate. Yeah. Now I ask you, because you like me probably already forgot how the vector fields looked like, which describe this dynamics, can I understand the dynamics just out of these training data. So the training data are, is one sample of a uh, Brownian motion together with one solution along this Brownian motion. You might say, of course, we just map this guy to signature and we learn the regression on this one of signature and then I have encoded my dynamics in the regression code then you might say, not of course, because signature is complicated to calculate, but we have this cheap version of signature, the, the random one. Let's try it with that. So let's do that. I take my Brownian path. I take uh, the reservoir. Now this is a truly low dimensional object, the dimension is only 150, not in the millions, a signature, it's a 150 dimensional guy, which is calculated precisely with the method which I showed you before. So it is calculated with this uh, 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 randomly uh, chosen uh, 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 stochastic dynamic system, and I make the regression. Now the regression is cheap, so the training, this was the training, this was the whole training. And you see also the regression coefficients are all of the same order of magnitude, about 2, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So this is also always an extremely good sign if you have a regression where the coefficients are not uh, of different orders of magnitude. It's a very well-conditioned regression. Why is it so well-conditioned? Because we have a proof that it has to work. And we know that the coefficients cannot go through the roof. Let's look uh, in sample. You see it is not perfect. Now yeah, what does it mean not perfect? We have only learned, so in sample was up to 1000. So actually, even though it did not see that, it perfectly predicts almost up to 1,500, so half of the time into the future, given, of course, the Brownian motion, the correct Brownian motion. So it means the dynamics is extremely well encoded into these uh, coefficients. And now, but now we are not surprised anymore, we can look at the generalizations and what happens if I take a completely different Brownian motion. And you would say, not bad up to 250 into the future, it actually captures this complicated dynamic very well. So just to do that again, uh, by the way, just to show you where the reservoir sits, the reservoir is, uh, yeah, I, have to, I owe you a little bit of explanation why I use a sigmoid function here, but I 
we'll just uh, say that later. But essentially, the reservoir is a random matrix times the state plus a random uh, uh, bias. And the random matrix is chosen here. Yep. We'll do it again. Again, we get the uh, solutions of this equation along a different uh, path. Calculate the reservoir, calculate the regression coefficients, look how well it does in sample up to 1000 and also up to 1500 it does relatively well and then we look for generalization. And you see, the first part is good, and then it deviates a little bit. Um, we can capture the dynamics, even though we only learn on one trajectory. This is a little bit what we were talking before. I only have one trajectory, but I know on this trajectory, if I go to the reservoir, I will have... Um, uh, a linear regression which allows me to represent these two-dimensional dynamics as a linear combination of this 150-dimensional dynamics and then uh, uh, this regression has to work. You see it also that it works and of course if it holds for one Brownian motion it should hold also for all the others at least for a short time into the future. Okay. I have three questions. Yes? First question is, uh, apparently you, the theorem you used uh, compute the dimension uh, that you can uh, use uh, to encode your, your, yeah. your dynamic. And when I see the coefficient 23 divided by epsilon, so it, and even if you have a log, you know, log of 1 million times 23 divided by a very small number could still be a huge number. Yes. And uh, so, is it interesting? You know, it seems to be interesting. Even if n tends to infinity, uh, you have log of infinity is still infinity. So it's I always say log of infinity is finite. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, all know that the logarithm explodes, but who, have, who has ever seen? <laughs> and the, the second uh, remark is what you did. Uh, one step you encoded the, the, the dynamic, maybe you can iterate, iterate it. That Absolutely. And but this is precisely how one uses it then, that you iterate this map which goes for a short period into the future well, you iterate it. And the, the third remark is, uh, how does it compare to uh, the result you can get from a recurrent uh, neural network? It's a very cheap way to train a recurrent network. You can consider this type of uh, random signature as a random recurrent neural network. And this is actually what we wanted to prove. Random recurrent networks are universal. And this is a way how to prove it. If the internal state can get large. This is why I put a sigma there, because this is then really looking like a recurrent neural network. Okay. Yeah, so that's all. Yes. Uh, would it uh, would it help to replace uh, such a random matrix by a, a better form uh, uh, set, such as a tessellization of uh, RK or something? Like that? I think there are different different people use different methods there, and I'm not. Uh, this is the only method which we have so far, but I believe very much that there will be completely different methods coming to the same conclusion. Tessellation of uh, of RK when K is huge. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, just uh, like for those for, for such example where where K would not be. Yeah. That not, that be. I now have to look if it works. Yeah, very good. I was live downloading some data and usually the data provider uh, this takes a while and then it doesn't answer and the, uh, uh, but we have good luck so this is a real work situation this is now as Sergei asked 
these are now one price trajectory and we are only calculating with this price trajectory. We want to understand whether we can understand the dynamics of one price trajectory. So what do we do? We download prices from, I think, um, a couple of years, daily prices of uh, um, from 2014 to 2019, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and I think Bank of America. And we take those prices, so these are four prices uh, each day, and we calculate uh, somehow um, normalized returns, normalized and decorrelated returns. So I do a very simple procedure. I take the returns, I calculate in the time window 30 days back the empirical covariance, and then I divide the returns by the inverse of the square root of the empirical covariance, and I get decorrelated normalized returns. And I say, if this market is driven by a four-dimensional Brownian motion and unknown vector fields, this is the Brownian motion. So let's do that. So we calculate here the uh, covariances 30, 30 days back. One has to play a little bit. It uh, took me a while. This is how the normalized returns look like. It's not really fully normalized, but it is also not completely clear. Why did you decorrelate the time series? Because I want to have the market brown in motion. I believe that the market is driven by a four-dimensional Brownian motion and I want to have these four Brownian motions. And these are the four Brownian motions. So this is the market Brownian motion. If there is something like a market Brownian motion, this would be a cheap way how to get it out. And now I have the situation as before. I have four Brownian motions mapping in a nonlinear way to four prices and I would like to understand the regression. So I make now, I take the four Brownian motions, map it to my random uh, reservoir, and then I make a regression, and then I have the market dynamics. Now, without any pain, I mean, this is a, a four-dimensional econometric model, which I just estimate by regression. So in that sense, it's actually relatively nice. So these are the prices. Randomized uh, signature method. The randomized signature method. Of course, you can play with different parameters here and so. But the the messages, the take-home message here is, it is actually a relatively simple uh, technology. It's just a regression on a random dynamic system which does the job of detecting the dynamics, which is unknown very well, at least for a short amount of time. Um, questions so far? So I would say that you, you encode the correlation or the, the the cooperative behavior of several time series together with yeah. within, um, I, say, I, I don't know what it is, a um, set of coefficients. The regression coefficients encode the vector fields and in that sense the full dynamics of the system. So all the correlations, all things are in the regression coefficients. Yeah. And you have any idea about uh, how you could understand it? The coefficients? Yeah. No. No, this is like a meaning. The coefficients itself don't have a meaning. I can only understand them in the sense that I know that in sample they represent perfectly the kind of copula or no. 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 I, mean, I would rather see. Maybe it's the best projection of the real manifold on your generated manifold. That uh, this weight is that of, is that of scalar products that allow to project uh, the real market prices on your uh, reservoir uh, yeah. generated by people, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, 
The real manifold would be signature. Signature you would like to take, but this is too expensive to generate. Signature is, of course, a, a geometric object which lies on a certain submanifold. And instead of taking this complicated one, which we don't, are not able to calculate so well, we take the random projection of it, which has almost the same properties. And you see that the regression works so well, which uh, allows to represent the dynamics. But the coefficients have uh, no meaning in the sense, even if you calculate what the coefficients mean uh, precisely, you will see these are random linear combinations of coefficients of the vector fields. So they cannot have a directly interpreted meaning because there's also a randomness inside coming from the random projection. Um, People in reservoir computing, when I showed it to them, this uh, consideration, of course, they did not like it at all. Why? As I have to tell you at the end, and this is a little bit of so now coming to my most recent research. I was a little bit disappointed, of course, because I like this result a lot. Um, what do people in reservoir computing actually do? So they do something very similar, but they always do it with discrete paths which come from minus infinity and go to zero. These are, uh, let's say, how will you say that in English class? Uh, really convinced, die-hard time series analysts. For them, a time series is a stationary uh, sequence, discretized. And the stationarity means that you don't have an initial value. You start at minus infinity, and your uh, control is actually given as a sequence indexed minus infinity up to zero. Our point of view in stochastic analysis is always you start at zero and you go into the future. They come from minus infinity and stop at zero. What do you need in order to, uh, to set up uh, this signature analysis which I showed before, in, in such a setting, you need stationarity. Otherwise, you cannot come from minus infinity and go to zero if there is nothing stationary here. So the question is, if you have a control, for instance, the increments of Brownian motion, which are stationary, and if you calculate the signature which I showed you before, is this producing something stationary? And the answer is no, it doesn't. It's not stationary. Because the signature has higher and higher polynomials, and actually you are ending up with something which is not stationary. So, trouble. Is there a stationary version of signature? This was the question. Which they asked me, and then this would give them more satisfaction. This, uh, and of course, from the point of view of uh, of signature analysis or analysis of this uh, dynamic system which I showed you before, this is a somehow unusual question. A question which people, the, for Terry Lyons, for instance, signature is a hard-coded thing. It has to look like that. There's a theorem which you use there. You don't change this guy. This is for you. This is a universal object. And to make it stationary is also a funny question in such an infinite dimensional setting. But <clears throat> we worked a little bit in that direction, at least one sort of solution I can try to, con uh, to convince you. I don't go into details of this uh, <coughs> uh, time series analysis. There's the notion of the filter. The filter is actually nothing else than a recurrent neural network on a stationary input sequence. So a solution of the differential equation on a stationary input sequence. And the question is, can we make a reservoir computing approach to find a stationary reservoir such that I can give a semi-infinite input and still have a finite value of that guy? And I don't go actually now into these uh, wordings here. I just show you actually how it looks like. So the discrete time signature process is an object which looks very much like signature. It looks like a discretization of the differential equation with an additional little 
caveat, namely that you subtract some uh, drift here. Lambda is something smaller than 1. So if you have xt minus 1 plus lambda minus 1, xt minus 1, you get actually a little bit of negative drift there. And at least in this algebraic object, this is a multiplication of this Hopf algebra, at least this algebraic object will have the property that you have a former stationary. Every coordinate stays uh, in a compact set with high probability. The compact set is getting larger and larger and larger, but it doesn't matter. At least it stays formally uh, stationary. You can even write it down. This is then the discrete time version signature, and this gives the <coughs> Uh, you see this looks like the iterated integral, so everything looks very similar, but still it is a really different object in particular because you can take a semi-infinite coming from minus infinity input here and you still get the solution there which exists. Again, the same problem holds. <coughs> this uh, signature you have here is uh, formally nice to define and it's easy to uh, Proof properties, but it is of course difficult to calculate it completely because this x takes values in an infinite dimensional algebra, this hop algebra AB. Now you will come and say, well, I know what to do, Joseph. We make a random project. <coughs> and this is what happens here. Even though here the calculation is a little bit more cumbersome, <coughs> the theorem applies which you always have in uh, time series analysis, continuous time is very structured and nice. Discrete time is neither structured nor nice. You end up with combinatorial problems. You cannot take derivatives. Everything is different. So things are a little bit less structured. But philosophically, you can prove a very similar statement there, that the random projection of signature produces a dynamical system which also comes with a random matrix and this dynamical system is also stationary and you can use it in order to approximate dynamics. Why are the reservoir people, reservoir computing people so much insisting on stationary dynamics? Why is that? Because they want to get rid of the time deterioration of the approximation. You saw before, a couple of days in the future, the uh, signature method gives you a good prediction of the dynamics, but at a certain point it deteriorates. This one does not deteriorate, because there is no time dependence in the constant. And therefore they always look for the stationary uh, 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 results. And this is of course what also makes uh, uh, reservoir computing um, successful because they, they get results which hold for a very, very long time into the future. So let me look a little bit if I have this implementation here. The dimension of the reservoir is here 500. It's a 500 dimensional reservoir. Uh, they always use the wording echo state network, uh, even though this, they do not completely uh, uh, use it in the right way. But actually, what this guy here is, is just a discrete dynamic system with a stationary input sequence, which itself is also stationary. I have an unknown dynamics and I would like to learn it. First thing always here is warming up steps and then we look at the, the unknown dynamics. So this is how it looks like. These are the returns of these dynamics. It's a relatively non-linear and even a very complicated dynamics in the sense that you have highly oscillating vector fields. 
So they are, this is a dynamics where you would say this is really not easy to predict. And now the question is, can we with this uh, signature method here actually of this five-dimensional dynamics, it's a five-dimensional dynamics, can we um, find a regression? Here it takes a little bit of time, the calculation, because always when we do this, uh, this setting, it is like that. This is a stationary dynamics, so you need a warm-up phase, or they call it always washout, a washout phase where you let the dynamics system run until you reach the stationary state, and then you have this uh, uh, stationary uh, behavior. And this makes the calculations a little bit longer, but we have now this 500-dimensional reservoir, and we can calculate the regression coefficients. Also, as we had it before, good. And you see, in sample, good. This is the replication of this complicated system in sample. It is not as perfect as before. You always have little error, but the errors go in both directions in that sense. If you were summing it up, these are the errors on the returns. This is actually a relatively good uh, fit of, this, uh, um, <coughs> of the path associated to it. But now when you look into the future, you can go long into the future, and this might take a little bit of time, when you calculate it, you can go long into the future, and you still get actually relatively convincing results, in the sense that as long-term predictions of this time series capture a couple of aspects which uh, which you have there, even though you're really far in the future. It does not depend on time. So this is the, the stationary version. Yeah. You also see from time to time the following phenomenon. You realize that you have this random matrix inside, and sometimes the reservoirs are not good. So you have to generate a new one in order to get the task uh, appropriately done. So this takes a little bit of time, but then gives actually um, long-term prediction of this um, of this time series. Some aspects you get quite well. And the sizes which you have there depend on really complicated functions, so it is actually amazing. It is not the going up and going down, it is that it gets the correct sign and that the size is correct. This is what it gets. Okay, so this is uh, the discrete version of this. Uh, uh, Signature business. Uh, questions so far? Yes, please. Um, yeah, regarding this uh, signature decomposition, don't you see any analogy with uh, the Gaussian kernel the problem? Because it's the same, I see, I mean, the idea is the same, is to find the best set of functions that which you can project yeah. the function. So you mean you think of uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces in kernel methods? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it's, it's a very similar problem. The only difference is uh, in uh, abstract language that signature or random signature is a dynamic system. So you have the time component in generating these features. If you have an additional piece of info information coming, neither the regression coefficients change nor does your setup change. You just add this additional bit of information and you get already the 
uh, the value. So in that sense, it's a little bit different. Usually, it is a not dynamic view when you have reproducing quantities. Yeah, so the, the analogy would be a dynamic uh, curve. Right. And this, in my view, people are working a little bit on that, but this is not now. Thank you. Please. W would, it make, would it make sense to use a special shape of random matrix, like a circular matrix or, or not totally? Here I use uh, usually uh, normally generated Gaussian random matrices or cut off Gaussian uh, random matrices. So actually something very standard. Um, I am actually convinced that for particular problems it makes sense to use particular types of random matrices, but I have no idea how to prove that or how to make it clear which one. Use. I have neither a recipe nor a whole lot of But I think there is uh, there are good reasons to, uh, to uh, believe that this, uh, there's a connection. I mean, some aspects I know. For instance, the variance of the random matrix, this you have to tune. So if you take the variance too large, the reservoir does not work at all. If you tune it down to a value which fits to your system, then it starts to work. So some Things you know, but the, the law, the particular law, is a law. <coughs> Other questions, please? I have a question. Is it a way to transform a, a non Markovian, highly non Markovian uh, dynamic into a Markovian one? It's a projection of a Markovian dynamic, of a high dimensional Markovian dynamic. In that sense, it is. If it was non-Markovian, it stays non-Markovian because it's a projection of a high dimension and Markovian dynamic projection does not need to be Markovian. But if it was Markovian, yeah, whatever that precisely means, you can only have one pass. But you, yeah, you reconstruct systems as projection of high dimensional Markovian systems. Can you simulate the rough volatility through the system? Can you simulate? The rough volatility model? Yes, of course. So, and uh, in rough volatility you can even prove a little bit more because in rough volatility we know that there are high dimensional Markovian systems whose one dimensional projection is a rough volatility. So this we know and we can think of these guys as sort of uh, random projected versions of these high dimensional Markov processes. Yeah. Other questions? A stupid question is have you I ever cannot imagine only this. <laughs> <laughs> and I can imagine a lot. Okay. Uh, have you ever um, try to define a way to make money from this. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I can translate uh, this predictive power into trading rules and yeah. see at the end if it makes money or not. It's a bet. Instead of looking at uh, the shape of the, of the time series, just translate it into a number. Is yeah. it going to make me a, a lot to, to predict? We play a little bit uh, with this method in... Uh, in a company in Switzerland who play a little bit making predictions with the signature method and um, uh, using them in order to set up portfolio rules. And of course in high dimensional markets there where usually you don't really have an idea how to set up rationally a portfolio rule which goes in the details of the market because you have these 20 stocks and how do you say make a portfolio rule uh, but with such a method we can try that and some results are promising. Some results are promising. But it's not done. Yeah. You wouldn't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> the results I mean I told you some results are promising but it is not so uh, not mature yet to, to talk about it. And I said the method is a little bit different. It is not Precisely the same that I do here, but a little bit uh, derivative of it. Um, you can think 
Signature is a way how to encode the information of a past very good, very well. If you know the signature vector at the point 1, you can prove that actually the path is uh, up to time transformation, so how quick business time runs, is encoded in this vector. So there is only one path having this signature vector. Therefore, you can use signature vectors to classify paths. If two signature vectors are different, the paths have to be different, up to uh, running, uh, up to the speed how the path is uh, uh, run through. And up to the trivial things that the path has such tree-like uh, 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 properties, which are usually a price path does not have. So signature is classifying paths. It's a classifying vector of paths. It has also to be like that because our basic um, our basic picture which we have here tells I can write any nonlinear dynamics as a linear regression of that. So if this is true, and the linear regression of course does not depend on time, the coefficients don't depend on time, it has to be like that that this map is injective. Because otherwise take a map which uh, take a dynamical system which for two different Brownian inputs or U inputs which produce the same guy here produces a different dynamics and you could not have a regression which does that. So therefore this map has to be injected. Therefore this guy fully encodes the information of the path. And this you can use in order to compare market situations, different market situations. You can take the market, let's say, the last 30 days up to today, and you can calculate the signature of this, and then you can look in the past where you had a market with a similar signature. And then you can say, okay, if the market situation three years ago was so comparable to today, maybe also tomorrow's return will be very comparable or at least an average. And this is a method which we use. So we use it in order to look either for market anomalies to say this is a very particular signature vector which corresponds to a very particular market situation and if there was once a particular market situation and it reappears, then we should be able to predict the next return. And this works up to some extent, but at least in average it works well. So this is a um, actually a drift estimate of the market, but a funny one. A funny one. Uh, would it be possible to have an information uh, interpretation in terms of information theory? Uh, possibly yes, but I'm probably not the right person to do that. I mean, these are very good classifiers containing if you take signature with a decent amount of, no, with a big amount of work encoding the information of the path in this discrete vector. The question whether this is the most efficient way to encode the information of the path, I cannot answer that. I would suppose yes, because it is a, uh, a discrete uh, amount of, um, uh, of numbers encoding the, the whole trajectory. Terry calls it the nonlinear Fourier transform. It's a transformation of the path into this signature. It, it reminds a little bit TSME uh, methods, you know, the, the way to encode uh, the, the distance uh, in um, high dimensional space within. But at the, here are two or three dimensions yeah, okay. where you, you can see clusters and things like okay. that. I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but I will take a look at it. I mean, what did they do, for instance, also with the signature method, since it classifies so well trajectories? There is a very famous example of trajectories which would like to classify. This is Chinese handwriting. Chinese handwriting is a trajectory in, in, in the plane. It's a piecewise continuous trajectory. Mm -hmm. And if you calculate signature of Chinese of such a handwriting, you can super well classify 
uh, the meaning. And this works very, very well. So it's one of the one of the really competitive uh, Chinese handwriting recognizers, the signature, because it is uh, has some robustness. If you make a little deviation, the signature does not change a lot. But the overall structure, which is characteristic for this, is included in the signature. If we, uh, if we could use the signature in a dirty, if we could use the signature in order to see some change of drift, which is yeah. uh, interpreted as uh, the expected return of the market, perhaps for the macroeconomist or for a strategist, we could use it in order to find similar trends in the market at a specific time. Yes, this is a little bit what we try. We try to find similar. I mean. Even if it's average, because we don't say that there's a yeah, no. For the average, it is clear that if you have similar signature of the market for the last 30 days or for the last year, then the, then the expected return should be the same on the next day. Could we, could we think of it as a change of the probability measure? If the signature is different, or it's, uh, does it have a meaning to think about it? I mean, it's a pathwise quantity. In that sense, it does not speak about the probability measure. Just mm -hmm. speak about the path. Uh, only about the path. Only about the path. Yeah, the the yeah. best way is to think about the, the, the trend, you know, the, the yeah. drift of the, yeah. the expected return yeah. would be a good explanation. Of course, you are uh, you are you are bringing me into a contradiction here. Say you only speak about the path, but you are estimating the uh, expected return, which is of course not the pathwise quantity, mm -hmm. but you know that the conditional expectation on the path, this is a pathwise quantity, and what did you, that you can speak. But this depends then on the probability measure. This is true. And you need that it works, you need some sort of stationarity. So in that sense, you speak a little bit about the probability measure of your right. Other questions? I'm very happy about your questions, it's very interesting. If this is not the case, I'm, uh, I'm approaching, I'm slowly approaching uh, the end of this uh, hopefully inspiring or interesting um, lecture. Um, you see, in my view, there is there are a lot of mathematically interesting questions in machine learning. Why does it work so well? Uh, what is the role of randomness? Uh, why is it uh, why, is, why is learning so quick? Why can it be done so quickly? All these questions are so mathematically interesting and fascinating. And also, what I find very fascinating is the applications in financial industry because we are able, in my view, first time to um, implement thought processes more or less directly into numerical technology. So I imagine a market environment given by scenarios, given by frictions, given with certain liabilities, given with a certain uh, set of preferences, maybe different agents, and you can directly write that into code and let this environment uh, get to better equilibrium. This is a, somehow for me at least it was a surprising insight that what I think about a certain situation, I can more or less directly put it into the merits. And probably, yes? I have a question uh, about the reservoir signature. Uh, is about the reservoir signature. So you take a lot of, I mean, uh, the dimension, I mean, the, the, the dimension of the kernel you are projecting to is like 500. 500. Yes. But uh, could you do like people in a web, let's like uh, trying to statistically test if the coefficient in the front of each of these 500 co uh, uh, kernels is zero or not, and remove that, or, or just doing a lasso regression? Uh, uh, I tried once. To do lasso, and uh, somehow I was not so convinced of the result. But I did not uh, uh, further follow it, and maybe I made a mistake. I believe that this helps. 
the nice thing about this, uh, this classical regression is there you actually just work with the formula. And since everything is so nicely <coughs> conditioned, you don't need to regularize. So, uh, therefore, I used it. But of course, one should, one should uh, analyze it. It's not yes, so because nice. it's single processing. I mean, uh, well, it's wavelets, well, theoretically, wonderful. <coughs> but when you remove noisy uh, wavelets, uh, it works far better practically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're completely right. You're completely right. No, I would um, love to see that how that works uh, in, uh, in, uh, when one thinks a little bit deeper about the regression aspect. Yeah. So there is one field in this fascinating area of machine learning, as I said before, mathematically fascinating and also fascinating from the applications, which I did not touch so far in the in the lecture and where you have of course great specialists in Paris and also here in the in the lecture room this is reinforcement learning. So as I said um, machine learning technology applied let's say to solve stochastic optimization problem to solve Hamilton Jacobi uh, Bellman uh, 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 equations to solve Bellman equations and Fascinating is it, it is in so far because it is surprising how well it works and that's not understood at all. And I'm very curious and I would actually uh, uh, be happy uh, to, or I, my working group, we are, we, are, we are working on that to understand this unreasonable effectiveness of, uh, of machine learning to solve hamilton jacobi bellman equations to understand that better. I did not speak about that, but I just wanted to also tell you this is extremely interesting to analyze that a little bit. So for instance, one as a financial application what we recently tried is something very simple. Take a stochastic problem, an optimization problem where you actually don't really know well how the solution looks like. Maybe only in a one-dimensional case, but in a high-dimensional case, you don't know. What, is, what are famous problems of the type, for instance, passport options with correlated uh, 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 exchange rates? Then one does not really know how the solution looks like. It's from a from a from a point of view of an optimization problem. It's a borderline regular problem, and uh, it's really an unfriendly problem. And we made there. A, uh, machine learning implementation. But when you, from a financial point of view, explain what you do there, it is really ridiculous that it works, but it works. <laughs> so it is, uh, you simulate your market, you take again a couple of trajectories, then in this problem, actually the, the strategies are uh, just invest in one and zero in all the others, or go short in one and zero in all the other. So actually the actions of this system are plus minus one and zero for all the others. And plus minus one for one of the rates. Yeah? This you know out of the theoretical considerations. You can immediately say. What you do first is you generate randomly plus minus one valued uh, strategies and you do the thousand, five thousand, seven thousand times and you look for one of the trajectories you have where one of the random strategies did a good job by chance. So it produces actually a nice uh, 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 expect, not expected return, actually just return at the end. Then you say, okay, this was not a bad strategy. You remember this strategy. Randomly chosen strategy but conditioned on the fact that at the end the outcome is not bad. Then you say, okay, I train a neural network, input is time and uh, the prices, and I train the neural network such that along this trajectory the neural network would give precisely this randomly selected strategy which performed well. So you, you train yourself on successful randomly selected strategies. Now you have a neural network which encodes this information of this randomly selected strategies. And then you iterate this procedure. The iteration would be a little bit complicated to, to explain, but you just iterate this procedure and you somehow come extremely quickly into 
close to optimal uh, uh, areas of <coughs> this uh, problem by just encoding again and again uh, the successful randomly generated strategies into neural network, make the neural network learn better and better how success looks like. And you generate success by randomly producing it and looking what comes up. <coughs> so uh, from a financial point of view, this is uh, surprising that such a method works, but this is actually one of the, one of the algorithms uh, which, is, uh, which can be used in, in uh, reinforcement learning. And I find it very fascinating to analyze. Um, I did not speak about it for the sake of time. As a little bit, it is a different uh, uh, topic, and I feel maybe not also maybe the most competent at the moment. But I just wanted to bring your attention a little bit. Well, otherwise, Michel, it's a little bit earlier than uh, the. Uh, the uh, it was foreseen, but I think we had a long day. And, uh, just a quick question. Yes, please. Uh, I mean, um, aside uh, JP Morgan, aside JP Morgan, which, which has been investing a lot of machine learning, yeah. do you think uh, in the industry, I mean, banks uh, in general are investing a lot of money on the machine learning? Do you think that, I mean, if they don't, they might be losing something and might be behind? Since technology is going fast today. Now we were told that there are 60 yeah. people at the JP Morgan in London working on uh, machine learning. Yeah. 60? 60. 60. Yeah. 60. Yeah. 60. Yeah. 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 And uh, outside Bullion's uh, group, I yeah, would yeah. say that. And, and, and on top of these 60 people, you have uh, Bullion's group, Hans Bullion's group, yeah. where you collaborate with. Uh, yeah. I don't know how many people they have here. These are huge groups, yeah. and they even they, they recently talked to the gift too. And uh, it's been uh, in production, I mean, uh, yeah. deep uh, hedging yeah, yeah. for a year and a half. So it means that they, st they started uh, at least five years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was a little bit, yeah. I mean, More they have a couple of things in production. They are yeah. uh, coming from machine learning. They, they use it a lot. They are fascinated about its... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 success is they also have a signature method mm -hmm. implemented there. It works also very well, so they do a lot of different uh, yeah. learning technologies. And I believe that uh, this change of paradigm in how you, uh, which technology you use in financial industry, this will not really go away. This will rather stay. So is that this is also, also at least my observation, or this is the reason why so many uh, bankers or people also from the insurance industry are so interested in that, because they feel this is something which might change a little bit. Uh, back to your initial example uh, where we were trying to recognize on writing. Uh, I've seen in a finance example where machine learning is applied to to try and fail up to 97%, for example. Yeah. Uh, but I have never seen uh, papers showing uh, machine learning how to recognize its confidence, to say, OK, uh, I, I'm aiming not, not to improve my 97, but I'm aiming to be uh, right maybe 99%, uh, to up to a 99% confidence. Uh, on those uh, 97 uh, or so uh, percentage, and be able by myself to say on those three percent, I'm really not sure. Yeah. Is, is there any trial to to say to, to give to, as a goal to the machine learner not only try to recognize a, a digit, but also to assess the confidence? Yeah, I mean. Usually when you train longer, you always have this assessment of accuracy and uh, standard machine learning algorithms stop when the accuracy reaches a certain threshold. In that sense, we have, here we stopped very early. Okay. Just for illustrative purposes. But, but, but at, at that point, when you, sh when you display, for example, uh, so, someone who is really fuzzy uh, handwriting, yeah. is the machine able to say, in that case, I prefer not to say because I, I really hesitate between uh, two or more. Ah. So you talk about the distance to the training data of, uh, of the... 
I mean, there are, of course, uh, the technology uh, uh, saying that but the machine says this is too far away from the training data. Actually, I don't okay. want to touch this. Because for, for industrial purposes, this, this, this is key. Important. This is key Absolutely. because you, 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 you wouldn't like to hedge and, and, and sleep while the machine is doing crazy right. stuff. You would like uh, the machine to call you yeah. to say, I'm not sure. I mean, the machine is an artificial trader, and it's in that sense like a trader. Also, you should not always sleep well when the trader is trading. <laughs> 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 Any more questions before we close? Yeah. Maybe I just have a comment to your to, uh, to, uh, question about banks uh, uh, investing in machine learning or not. Uh, what I'm seeing around is that, of course, investment banks are investing a lot, but, uh, but maybe. Uh, uh, this aspect that we saw today, so uh, I mean, either deep uh, edging or fast edging, is a very tiny part of their investment because they put a lot of, of them, all these big banks and banks are addressing a lot of other problems, like uh, I mean, uh, trying to find the best client for a market maker and to other yeah. positions, you've got all the uh, automatic translation, you've got uh, compliance issues, you've got using satellite images and so on, that are now into banks, so. Uh, so for sure, banks are investing a lot of money, but... Uh, just the research, a lot of putting in... Oh, no, putting in production. I, I'm seeing that. Yeah, all these aspects, I mean, digital, digital banking, uh, they are, they are, some of them are in production, for sure. Yeah. No, these are other aspects of machine learning which have not been touched at all. What I touch here is just replacing classical numerics by this new sort of numerics and seeing <coughs> solutions which we did not see so far. Well, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank, uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you.